Sting. Yeah, all right. Are we good, Quinn? Okay, it is uh, just after two o'clock, and I will open this uh, special workshop of the Grand County Commission on Economic Development Diversification Funding. Present, we have Commissioners Kevin Walker, Evan Clapper, Bill Winfield, Trish Hedin, Mike McCurdy, Mary McGann, and myself, Jacques Hadler. Uh, we have uh, County Clerk Gabe Wojtek, County Administrator Mallory Nassau, Associate Administrator Quinn Hall, and our Strategic Development Director, Chris Baird. Um, I will now turn the workshop over to August Granith and Chris Baird. Sweet. All right. Um, so uh, just a high level overview is we're going to be discussing the balance of funds uh, to be allocated out of the economic diversification activity portion of the transit group tax uh, before the law changes on July 1st. So we'll do a, an overview of how much money is left and how we got to that calculation. Um, process that we've gone up to this point is um, we did a brief survey, got some public input, kind of go over that survey result briefly. Um, and then that survey result also brought in a handful of proposals from the general public that has been addressed ahead of time, uh, brought that to an economic development board meeting, and all of those proposals. Last week, while I was out of town, Chris was in attendance, board chair, board Rogers was in attendance, in addition to several of the applicants and proposers who are here today to answer any questions. Um, they went through a scoring exercise to kind of get an initial ranking um, of those programs to inform discussion. And they had a discussion over an initial funding uh, recommendation, um, which we can go over here shortly. Uh, and then uh, let's start, maybe let's start with uh, what's in the proposals first. And I'll, I'll share my screen if that's okay. There we go. As this is a starting point. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So um, we started with these first four here, so proposals one through four. Um, we had uh, been aware of and was on our radar as uh, potentially contractable in a short time period, ready to go uh, projects. We put those out to the public in the form of a survey to get their input. So the first one here is uh, investments in the Mud Community Resource Center um, surrounding education, workforce, and entrepreneurship. That's the Mud Free Health Clinics project. Um, and the kind of public support for that survey, three of the survey is quite high for that that project. Um, uh, the second one was the senior business consultant salary and benefits this is a program we've already supported um, at $300,000 uh, to ensure full-time salary and benefits for a senior business consultant up at you know, Utah State University Moab uh, campus. That that has already been committed as first 300. Um, that person has been hired uh, and they started last week, June 1st. Um, we have Megan who can kind of speak to that process as well. Um, additionally, there is the um, Small Business Rotating Loan Fund. Uh, that's the Southeast Utah Association of Local Governments um, program that already exists. They have about $3 million of rotation in the, in the various Fort Wayne County area. Um, this is this is a place where we can put that money where it can stay circulating in the community over time. Um, Wildcat Microfund is a program run at Weber State University that provides uh, opportunities for small businesses to pitch, receive mentorship, et cetera. Um, that costs $40,000 a year would be for full-time or part-time staff to help administer that program locally. So it's more of a administration hurdle to access that funds rather than a fund contribution. Um, those are the four that went into the initial survey. Um, super quickly, I'll just go over the the public um, response to those proposals. So again, 
So um, here we are in the Moab Community Resource Center received, we had, a, I should say, this was open for two weeks, pretty brief, we got 137 responses. We wanted to make sure there was an opportunity for some public input, transparency of the process, um, an opportunity here for projects from the public. So a small sample, but still uh, realistic. Some, some level of information here. So the Moab Community Resource Center got really high marks. The, the Rotating Loan Fund and the USU Small Business Development Center uh, so your business consultant kind of received very kind of medium remarks, um, pretty evenly distributed on the rotating loan funds and uh, normal distribution and getting kind of a range of input. And then the micro fund got the kind of lowest scores here. Uh, that's what those numbers look like. Again, just differently. Uh, we also received a bunch of additional project proposals. Uh, these are a number of them here. Reached out to the folks that made those proposals and decided to submit something slightly more formal to for consideration did so. Uh, so I'll go into that next. Um, the other proposals we received were um, from uh, the Grand Canyon School District, specifically Cardi Taylor. Um, from the Career and Technical Education Student Career and Success Center. Um, uh, the vision there is to kind of be an intervention for students who aren't succeeding in our school systems, um, drive increased graduation rates, as well as vocational education um, and various ways to get those who are otherwise going to not graduate um, into a better position in their careers um, through early intervention here. Uh, this, the school district funded this hundred thousand dollars, and this two hundred twenty-one five hundred represents the balance of the funds. Uh, and Kari can answer more questions. There's also a request from a uh, child care for a capital fund for new home daycares. So the thought would be that the community uh, child care would provide um, initial capital for the development of a new daycare in the community to create more spots for child care in the community. And help them get on the ground at a cost of $25,000 per daycare. Wabi Sabi put in a request for $100,000 contribution towards securing a future building. Obviously, they no longer have a ticking time clock on their facility. Um, and I'm hoping to get some money to help secure that. They also considered the creation of a community foundation, um, serves an umbrella for all of the nonprofits in our community. Sea Haven submitted three proposals uh, ones that would drive financial literacy to uh, their client space, one that would help support child care payments for their client base, one that would help purchase, um, provide the down payment for the purchase of the building next door so that they can expand the campus. Redtail Air um, put in a request uh, for $95,000 for charter service to Salt Lake to help um, stem and gap uh, the gap that has been created by Sky West's going out of our market. Um, and then lastly, the Mud Arts Council put in a request for an arts administrator um, in the range of sixty dollars to $80,000. So what we did is we took those proposals, um, the full proposals are, are in the packet, um, and looked at how do we start to drive some level of, of difference between all of these programs. So we did a scoring process with the Economic Development Board, scored each program on six criteria diversification does the project meet the county's diversification goals impact to potentially create the greatest amount of change per beneficiary reach potential to affect change the greatest number of beneficiaries need potential for the program to address the community's greatest challenges value impact generated relative to the expense of the program feasibility and duration is it achievable will it uh, have a long-term impact so those who are in attendance scored them individually this is the averaging table which you see here uh, and each individual program scores for each individual category, which created a, an average here. Um, what happened next is that the, the Economic Development Board looked at um, and discussed each program and came up with an initial allocation. Uh, the number that they were guided to be aware of was about $600,000 of funds. Um, as you'll see shortly, um, Chris and I finished looking at financials and there's some more money uh, available for our last kind of calculation, uh, closer to 800. But their initial recommendation was $100,000 to add another year to the Small Business Development Center's programming. 
um, fully fund the um, Student Success Center, um, and then $250,000 to a loan fund. Um, there is discussion whether that should be um, the rotating loan fund or other programs. This program is called the Utah Micro Loan Fund. That could be a good option as well. And I'll let, uh, and then also that could also go towards supporting that Wildcat Micro Program. And Megan, who's online, can speak to any of those student programs. Um, there was also, as is written in the agenda summary, uh, more or less, the honorable mention that the next priority would be um, uh, supporting the red tail programming. There's some discussion about how to make that um, kind of better for the public interest. I mean, that's the, the proposal before you, which includes revenue sharing. Um, and Randy can speak to that. Um, and so I'm going to pull up a just the numbers that we have here, um, so that we're all we all know where we're coming from. Um, so how do we how did we come up with the amount of money we have available to allocate today? Um, we looked at the TRT revenues for economic diversification, which is one third of thirty seven percent of all TRT revenue. Um, which came up these numbers for each 2021, 2022, and 2023. Uh, calculated actual salary and benefit expenditures for economic diversification as a percentage of our staff's total salary and budget costs for, for 21 and 22, um, and 23, and forecasted out the rest of this month so that we have forecasted numbers there. Um, actual expenditures and liabilities. Um, so that's the start grant, flood grant, all of the rest of those programs. Uh, and, and money that we owe that we've committed to uh, to come up with this balance here. So just under eight hundred thousand dollars is what what we're looking at available to allocate uh, today. And so the worksheet that will be will be in this afternoon um, indicates the proposal number, indicates where uh, the economic development board ranked it as a result of its scoring here, uh, and then the initial recommended funding amount from the economic. So just to make sure I understand the numbers, so it looks like, you know, com compared to when the previous exercise we was done, there's an extra two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. So there's um, the funds remaining in addition to what the economic development board explicitly recommended. Um, yeah. Two twenty-six. Okay, I said yeah, yeah, I missed that line. Um, and then for the the numbers for twenty twenty-three, that's based on estimated revenue for the last. Couple of months before June. Christy, yeah. you that? So I just revised my projection March being your actual got here. And uh, surprisingly enough, March's figures came in pretty strong at 6% above 2022, oh. which is not what I was expecting based on the end of the year. But uh, so I revised that. Uh, I'm still running business pretty conservatively through the rest of the year. So the, the last three months, my fund got at about 10% less than 2022. Um, you know, we're talking about maintaining compliance with state law here. And so I have to be very careful about you know, our projections and how much we spend. So it's almost certain to be the case that even this number is going to be lower than reality, but it's, you know, it's for sure that we're not going to be able to spend. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions on on kind of how we got to that eight hundred thousand? We can pass the machine and sit in discussion. Um, I guess the only other thing to consider that I haven't flagged here yet is who has received funding from the county already. So the uh, my free health fund did receive a hundred thousand dollar grant from the um, county start grant program um, that went towards the community resource center. We did provide that $300,000 out of TRT um, to the Small Business Development Center. But Community Child Care has received a little under $200,000 total through the Rural County Grant Program. Um, CK would receive a start grant as the Red Tail Bear, uh, just for context of who's received money additionally outside of this program. Okay. Um, the other thing that came up that I should flag for opening discussion is that. The Community Resource Center was, um, I think, considered heavily as a 
potential recipient, but there was a lot of discussion happening about how that could be funded for those or other sources, including the Volcani Grant, various funds. Um, and so the, the, we're going to opt to take that to other funding sources. So that's, I think, the last thing. I, I might ask Forrest Hutch if I missed anything from that meeting uh, in terms of input to this conversation today. But no, absolutely. I, I and I am curious that so the, uh, the the public the highest public support was for the community resource center, but the board uh, decided um, not to recommend funding that through this at the time. If maybe Forrest could could go into that just a little bit more, but I would definitely recognize Forrest. And if you could, Forrest, come on forward. There, the uh, microphones at the table, if you if you don't mind. Uh, I'm going to share a, a bit of a prejudice, and that is that the survey, which was sent out in a very short period of time because of the requirement to move quickly to make the allocation decisions that are required, it was not as comprehensive or as um, statistically sound as we would ideally have preferred. Um, everyone believes in the everyone in the discussion believes entirely in what we're trying to accomplish as a community in the community resource center the vast majority of their five hundred thousand plus um, is for capital improvements okay. roofs um, work on a, one of the less developed facilities and the thanks to chris's per, uh, and august um, sense about what other sources of funding might be available to several of these projects, but especially to the um, Community Resource Center, we felt that that had a greater opportunity than many of the other applicants or identified potential beneficiaries to receive other funding through the Rural Counties Opportunity Grant, which we will be submitting an application for in September? December. December? Yeah. December. So, there was real concern about several, that several of the um, uh, proposals were for capital improvements. Yeah, I get it. And that's one of the reasons that the CK then request and the Wabi Sabi request were set aside. Mm -hmm. um, the concern that several members of the board had was that the request for Red Tails support was very, um, important to us as a community. I think Redtail and Randy, forgive me, Redtail refers to it as a charter service, but it's not the kind of charter service we tend to think about. It'll be regularly scheduled flights to and from Salt Lake. And there are several people who felt that for business purposes, um, for those who are going to Salt Lake to conduct business, um, to meet clients, potential businesses, and, and frankly, for our elected officials who have to go to Salt Lake with some frequency, um, that having that kind of simple, easy, day in and day out um, service would be possible. There were some concerns about the fact that we'd be making a grant to a private business, but we all felt that the proposal that Redtail made um, made a lot of sense to the group. It, do, it does answer my question. Yeah, thank you, Forrest. I appreciate it. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was basically there's was, was three to one support yeah. for that. So one held out. Uh, three to one support for the red tail proposal. Yeah. Okay. Voting that yeah. person. So that, and that person primarily was concerned with more or less uh, saying this is the private sector's yeah. opportunity and private sector's presence in this particular case. Yeah. Uh, so the question was how much does the public benefit from offsetting the risk of this potential venture? Right. May I add? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thing? There was also um, awareness of the blowback that the department received on the STAR grant because several not for profits got pretty significant support through the STAR grant program. Yeah. And they were also concerned that the uh, perception among the public and among especially business owners was that, again, we'd be 
making significant investments, especially capital investments in the not-for-profit not sector. And I just expand a little on the community resource centers. Part of their proposal um, was for a co-working space and the rural opportunity grant um, recently has been providing a rewarding <laughs> to co-working space. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's really the, the main reason why we decided, you know, why the EDAP board decided that it would be better to apply for that co-working space uh, project through that opportunity grant rather than do this. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I guess the last, last thought here is that it's a discussion, right? So we're not making yeah. decisions today, um, but at the next board meeting, the next commission meeting on the 20th, is kind of last call. Yeah, for uh, how you also call a special meeting, last week of June, which I'm not sure you do, um, to make actually binding contractual agreements um, to commit to spending this money right. for the budget. So what uh, we're looking for a staff today is ideally, you know, more or less a done recommendation if we'll go and make those contracts and bring contracts <clears> back <throat> in the next meeting. Um, but also if there's any additional work the direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Is is there any chance that the um the the seven hundred and ninety seven thousand dollar estimate changes much before the next commission meeting two weeks? Is there uh no because I I mean I'm not gonna get another TRT report until after our right okay so that yeah so that's the number to work with it really. comes early um, but we typically don't get the TRT and deposited yeah so I don't think so okay um, but that being said like you know it's it's very conservative number I think right so so it's the chance that there might be I mean it could be that there's a hundred thousand more wow. um, but you know, we're taking in a lot of safety. Yes. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and Bill, can you just hold on? Go ahead. Um, the fluctuating numbers that moves up and down, it seems to me like if there is money that gets put in the revolving loan fund, regardless of which one it is, that that would be the one to let fluctuate up and down after we've decided which other ones. Right. That makes sense. That it could put the money bit. into yeah. fully. It would make it easier. And then. Maybe I'm confused because I, I don't quite agree with the private sector. I mean, this is money for economic diversification. Now, it could be argued that Red Tail is not diversification, but I don't understand why we would be concerned whether it's a nonprofit or it's private sector. That is economic diversification in my mind. And then as, as far as me personally, I, I see the economic diversification is a, partly in our workforce from our graduating students. And I, I, to me, that's one of the highest priorities that I see there that we need to be funding to start with is that's just my personal number one. And then moving from there down the chain. But I, I guess unless you can explain, I don't understand the concern over the private. Uh, we just got some. I think we got some pushback from the state legislature and some, some folks who spoke. You know that they felt like no profit should be gotten. Oh no! But I was speaking was to the other opinion. side, to the yeah. one that was possibly going to a private business, which is Red Tail Air. So yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any uh, logic in that either. Right. And so the only statutory definition that we have to comply with for economic diversification activities that it just has to be reasonably similar to some economic development program in the state does. Yeah. Right. And there's many, many of those. And so I think we're good with all, you know, with all these proposals, I think that meets that statutory definition. Of course, you know, down the road, we'll get a more locally defined definition of diversification if we go through our strategic economic development plan process. But right now, I mean, I, I think that, you know, all of these are good to go. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to go back a couple of remarks. So, so Chris, you, you said for the March numbers, they were up like 6% compared to last year. I mean, what assumptions did you make about April, May, and June? 10%. 10% yes. less. Well, because February was 67%. 
you know, but uh, so, I mean, I think that it's probably, like I said, I mean, I can come up with a sec, you know, a, a second set of figures, so I guess, you know, that would be able to my finals. I'd also point no, no, out, like, you know, traffic numbers have been above those last year in recent months, you know, continuing through April and May, and March came in above. So well, I think at, so. At the next, you know, at the meeting when we approve all this, I'll run the number that 5% less, and you guys can decide if you want to risk it. I, 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 I appreciate your uh, yeah, <laughs> attempts at keeping yeah. conservative, Chris, for sure. Um, I, I'd also point out that 6% up is basically just keeping up with inflation this year. Right, um, Trish. Is it appropriate to ask questions of some of the? I, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Time. I think that's why folks are here, right? So, Randy, really quick, I just do you want to come up and I have a question or two for you. Sure. I don't know if you want to say. Yeah, and, and if a question then, is addressed to you, if you could come up, it, it, it uh, yeah, so people online us. and then so also the reporter. A couple, maybe not even, maybe just one question. So, how, what are you look looking towards as far as sustaining this program in the future? I mean, if we give you this lump sum now, that's great, but. What does it look like into the future? Our hope is that in, in the twelve month period that this grant would cover, that we would be able to um, we would market it effectively. We would okay. grow passenger count month over month over month over month. But where in twelve months, whether it be July first, Skywest selects to pull out early, or October first, which is when Contour Air is scheduled to start, um, we would um, we'd have the passenger count um, in place to be able to sustain it. Okay. Going forward. Okay. Cool. That's our real hope. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, that was just kind of my like you know concern is sure, and it kind of happens all the time with grant funding. It's like you get this pulse, and then it's like, how do we sustain this program? Right. right. Yeah, we do not want to pull out every one year. Right. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Uh, okay we're going to invest a lot of resources, a lot of money in marketing this. Okay. We do not want to pull out. Every okay. One great. Year. Thank you. Sure. Does anybody have more questions for yeah. Randy before? Because then I have questions for. But then uh, yes, yeah. Mike. Go ahead. Revenue uh, share proposal. Yes. Uh, are we capping that at the loan amount, ninety-five thousand, uh, or the, the rent? Yes. Okay. Oh, I should have put that in there. Thank You're you. Okay. Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if this is as successful as we hope it's going to be. Oh, I, uh, I mean, to I be able to pull back, uh, pay back that ninety-five thousand dollars back to the county to be able to use it for the loan revolving loan fund or whatever. Um, that'd be wonderful. When okay. It, um, so that's yeah. So yeah, we should cap it at at, at ninety-five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, Kevin? Um, and, and how full do the planes have to be in order for it to um, be sustainable for you? Sure. With, so, yeah, without any subsidy? With the $140,000 break even, that's four and a half passengers per flight. Okay. You okay. feel that's a pretty conservative number okay, for us. Um, we have uh, each Kodiak seats nine passengers. Okay. We have three Kodiaks. I, I mean, it would be wonderful. Okay, we could sell 27 flights per day. Okay, I'll fill three Kodiaks going to Salt Lake City. That'd be ideal. Okay, if we get to that point, yeah, we're looking at larger aircraft. We, we can discuss that internally. But um, yeah, so four and a half passenger per flight to, to, for us to recover our $140,000 investment, uh, our capital investment in this, this project. Yeah, thanks. What what uh, what days are you looking at? Just what are you Tuesday kicking around? Thursdays. Tuesday and Thursday. Thursday. Okay. okay. If we see that there's high demand, um, we can go you know, add a day, add a, mm -hmm. add a fourth uh, fourth day, add a fifth day, add a sixth day, add a seventh. Yeah, we're right. Really flexible. Yeah. Uh -huh. Great. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> and do you have staff? I, do you have pilots to be yes. able to do uh, that? Yes. Yeah, so we have uh, four uh, pilots that can fly the Kodiaks. Um, so yes, we do have we do have staff. We have a total of nine pilots, four that are licensed to be able to fly the Kodiak, um, a couple that are close um, that we'll be able to add the next year or so. But yes, we have the pilots. We have the rights. Trish, before yeah. you ask questions of other proposals, yeah. um, I wanted to respond, Bill, to your question about the discussion about the making an investment in a private business. Um, as, as um, August said, that was our honorable mention in terms of the top priorities. And I think there was very strong belief that it was something that this county needs, this service is important. Um, and the fact that we didn't put a number to it was just simply press for time and not really sure about whether that was a step that we wanted to take or we wanted to recommend at that time. Now, I know Randy has done some additional thinking about it, which 
very possibly would have changed and added that to a formal recommendation at this time. But it was not against putting money into a business, especially one that's increasing access to a community that lacks the kind of transportation access that many businesses need. Yeah, and, and I wasn't against putting it into private business. I'm actually the other side yeah. of that line thinking that we need to be working with private businesses to diversify our economy far more than we do with a whole list of nonprofits that are questionable what the value is. So I'd put it to the rest of the commissioners. It's 3.30 or 2.30. Um, I, I feel pretty good about the board recommendations on these numbers. And then it looks like we have another roughly uh 200,000 to, to to spend that takes almost that right so that would reduce it to to about a hundred thousand dollars after that if this yeah, I, I think i'm good with that too yeah thank you sounds like a well thought out um proposal and yeah i appreciate you guys bringing it to the table yeah, yeah. we're excited we have a lot of this service yeah thank you all right, so yeah, so I can plug it in right here. So this would be the flux of the allocated. So 100,000. If we go with the board's recommendation and the red tail proposal. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So since it's in the spreadsheets, should we discuss whether we want it to be there? Instead of sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I I think I also support the proposal, especially since we have you know more, more money than initially allocated. It, it does give me a little bit. I think linking it to economic diversification seems like a little bit of a stretch. I mean, I I think it's great for people who have a doctor's appointment or you know if you have to visit a state official. Um, but it, I think it is true that when people talk about barriers to e diversification, and well, one of the things that's cited is is transportation. That you yeah. know it's not all that easy to get here and so this addresses that a little bit so um i, th I think you just so I, I just wanted to register that um you know it, it, it takes a little bit of thought to, to relate it directly but i i'm yeah happy to support yeah. it thanks kevin all right so so folks are comfortable with with the board's recommendations on the on, on that great okay looks like looks like we have more or less consensus on that then uh, um one one wrinkle on that is the figuring out exactly which source the, uh, the loan loan fund right yeah program uh happy to also just take the direction that says you go figure it out it's yeah the best program and i'll bring it to you it's my negative spoke you go figure ready. it out okay <laughs> um, but, I was just going to take this back and also describe kind of like the pros and cons of various ones on the table for the board. I guess one thing I'd be interested in is just the amount of overhead for the different programs. Like it seemed like that Wildcat one was taking forty thousand dollars just to, to pay someone. You know, so it wasn't money that was going to the loan. Is that also true for the Southeast Utah one? Or? No, they're they're very different value adds, or the gaps are different. Um, uh, for, I mean, for you, get a summary of the various ways that we phrase that. The um, the forty thousand dollars for the micro fund, or excuse me, for the wildcat fund, is to staff the person who will do the processing of that. The wildcat fund is about one point four million dollars, and it doesn't. It's not. A, it's actually more of a grant than a loan. So you're using forty to leverage one point four that's possibly available to local businesses. And they're required to go through a process with the SBDC. So they're prepared for that kind of um, rigor in terms of making the, their case for that. Um, the the um, local government's loan fund is a fund that is typically one or 2% above prime because of the risk, but it's really more oriented towards expansion and there's several businesses locally who have received that fund and paid them off. Um, the Utah Micro Fund is really for more for startups and providing some technical expertise and then receiving loans. Those are anywhere between five and fifty thousand dollars. 
basically on the lower end. So there are three different funds that we could look at. And if August is, is directed to do some analysis, that money might possibly be allocated to only one or to two or possibly three. Okay, so, but just to make sure I understood correctly, for the for the Wildcat Fund, we're not actually, the money we're contributing is not going to be loaned out. It's just going to pay someone to tap into some a completely different set of money. Yes, can, can I add some stuff to that so that you have a yeah, yeah. picture of that? On the Please Wildcat me. Fund, by staffing that person, that person will actually be putting on the pitch deck competitions and things like that right here in that area. Um, and so it brings it all locally. That's one of the reasons why we needed the additional staffing is because it brings everything in the administration of that fund locally. We do have $1.2 million we can tap into, but that's a statewide fund. Um, the concern about staffing that one is we do, if we create that and we lose funding for that after three years, that essential job and additional work would fall on whoever the SBDC, which currently is Kima Johnson, um, would fall on her. And that would be an additional job that she would have to take care of, um, in addition to all the other stuff that she was doing as the SBDC currently um, in Grand County. And so that is concerning as we move forward with only having a certain amount of timing to bring that in. Um, on a limited amount of funding. Um, and so that's something that we need to take into consideration. Um, as far as the uh, Utah micro loan um, fund is why we brought that in, is because that's an SBA lender, um, approved SBA lender. And so they also give us additional uh, opportunities to add to that fund with things like the RMAP grant, um, and, and opportunities where we could make that more of a legacy, a Grand County legacy fund um, with additional opportunities in that way. And in return, also back fund the SBDC position on a longer term, because that's always been the concern about if we give her, her this amount of money, are we going to be able to maintain this position? And so looking at how we can utilize those different uh, programs to help build them into a longer term um, programs. I hope all that made sense. If it doesn't, feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, Bill. Also on the other note, I sit on the SCU ALG board, which administers the RLF, the revolving loan fund. And they did mention that I, maybe it was Chris or August has already reached out to them. So they're aware that it could potentially be coming up. And as to the overhead, the cost of that, I'm not sure that that would be part of the discussion to see how much they're going to charge to administer that loan fund. Yeah, it, it seems to me like they might use the interest to cover it, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure too. I mean, what we could do is those are the three options on the table. You know, you look at however many, however much money you allocate to this priority area, and get through the kind of a general contract with each of those people in terms of what are the terms, what are the overhead, and how does this work, and how much could we contribute, and bring that in a, in a way where we have, uh, unless there's one that you definitely want to work about, well, then, you know, bring a contract with a, you know, a highlighted X or right. the amount of dollars that we can decide on in that meeting. Is, is there a sense as to whether it'd be uh, more beneficial to, to break up the monies into the different funds or to keep it all together? Would it be more efficient to keep it all together? I think that I see, that, you know, there's two pieces of it, right? There's kind of the capital piece, which would be the micro loan fund and the rotating loan fund. Uh, well, the loan fund have often being used to help get money to collateralize a bank loan. Yeah. Um, and micro loan fund being smaller amounts. Um, to basically be a high risk, you know, collateral or background or financial history, the banks will not have to get them off the ground. So I think there could be value for both. I think there could be value to doing all in on one with the numbers. Yeah. I think they all seem to provide a certain amount. Yeah. And then the, the Wildcat Fund, would that 40000 be something that we'd have to spend every year on that? So it sounds like, I mean, the discussion, and maybe you can speak to this as well, the discussion on that seemed largely like we just threw 40000 at it, hired someone who's with us now, who is available, who's right. going to do that for that money part time. I think that was the downfall of the program in the first place. Yeah. Why are we making enough money to live in this town? That's why we 
want and can do a healthy contribution to the full time position to get someone talented and capable. So I would almost say, from my perspective, and Megan can push back here, but it sounded to me that the discussion was, was add either we had a second full time position at the USU office to supplement the SBDC and to cover this micro loan fund, even if a part time position would hypothetically open the floodgates on that micro loan fund. Yeah. Because are so we going to get somebody? Right. Sure. I'm not sure. Megan, did that did that capture the discussion? By adding the extra position for microloan? Yeah, yeah, it would it would need a need a minimum of part time, but preferably the full time just because of the load that it would take off. Yes. It seems a little, a little bit more complicated. Yeah, but it is. It is, and that's and that's part of the problem. Is it is more complicated than than what a lot of people like. I think originally perceived. So yeah, in in the EDAP meeting, we actually talked about two years of funding if we're okay. going to do wildcat. So you'd be looking at eighty thousand probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And wouldn't we want those positions, even the the one for the small business at the USU eventually they've got to get it sustainable on their own money rather than continuing to require an injection. So, I mean, three years is pretty standard in the business industry. If you're losing money for three years, you need to start looking at a different avenue. So to get too far out past three years funding something is enabling it in my mind. Yeah. And with, uh, we did talk about that. Megan, do you want to talk about that? We had a, this conversation at the end. Yeah. So, so ultimately, that position, um, and and that's a big part of that position, is, is creating the, the sustainability of that position and ongoing funding. We do create ongoing funding by different grants and different programs, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, for that position, and so. Uh, generally, like for example, my position here was started the exact same way. Um, we started on 100% soft funds and uh, I was able within two years to make it a permanent position um, by the programs and things like that that was created. Uh, granted, I did that during COVID when funds were a lot more readily available. And so the concern um, that we have is that by only having the three years. Um, and if I was able to do that during COVID, when we had funds more readily available, the three years is just not quite enough to create that sustainability, which is why we asked for the additional one to two years so that we have the long enough to create that sustainability for ongoing. Whereas if you only have three years, we might be able to make it and that's the goal. But it's just, I think my fear is it's just shy of creating that sustainable um, revenue sources um, between classes and between grant funding, ongoing grant funding programs, because you have to have the hours of, of counseling, you have to have the proof of capital uh, infusion, all of those different things on the programs that are created. Um, and so she's got to get acclimated to the area, which, um, and then she's got to run the programs for a minimum of a year and then write the grants, run the programs and turn them back in. Three years is a really short turnaround. So having that extra, at least one year, which is kind of why we, have that one year on there um, at least gives her that turnaround time to be able to to do the ongoing grant funding um, to start run that sustainability. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. All right. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin. Um, so so it sounds like the proposal that's on on the table is to start with the recommendation that came out of um, EDAP and then add the red tail proposal and then whatever additional funds we have some combination of the, the loans and staff will come back with a specific proposal at the next meeting about I, I think so yeah that, is, that, that sounds good to me too and i i think in, in in my head it seems like the revolving loan front from the uh association of local government seems to be the kind of the easy choice here but it, with that would that be uh specific to Grand County or would that be just right. contributing to the pot for all four counties? Yeah, they, they currently operate a Monticello specific, you know, San Juan County specific fund. So it's part of the course for them to say, is this eligible for 
Grand County businesses, yeah. Right. And, and as a revolving loan fund, it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. You like that, Mike? <laughs> All right. Um, and then I just, yeah, I, I agree with Mike. I really like the Career and Technical Education Student uh, Success Center. And and as far as that funding goes, is that a, that's like a one year funding? Is that to get? Yeah, Kari, do you want to come up for a sec? And I can, Kari, I'll bring up the budget. I know you wanted to do some public speaking, so. <laughs> Hi, you guys. I'm Kari Kaler. I know most of you, but those of you who I don't, I've been in the school district since 2000 um, and worked as an agricultural educator, as a um, work-based learning educator, and then as the director of career and technical education. And then I took a little detour and did some principal work, <laughs> and then I came back to career and technical education two years ago. Um, so I've been most of my career with the high school. We've seen this Concern at the high school, but the charts in here show that the concern for graduation rates have just kind of gone down, yeah. down, down right. since 2014. Um, and it looks like our performance rates, especially with COVID, are not any better when we look down into our eighth grade, our seventh grade, and our sixth grade. So we've just decided we have to do something different. Now, the question on the table was Is this one year funding? Right. That is what we hope, so our, our idea is to get this program off the ground. And then one of the pro, uh, positions built into the program is a VISTA who will do project development as well as um, community coordination. Um, and so ideally they're writing grants to be able to get this project um, going for the next few years. And Great. I like, you know, part of what we discussed, or they discussed, and I just listened, was that we are we are limited in what we have available to us for funding. Yeah. yeah. And so this is why this partnership is so amazing. Great. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, so so this is the pack that has each of the sub items. So there's the director role, which is you. I will be the halftime CTE director now and halftime SCFC director. Right. Yes. All right. Uh, so I have to do, and then there's the new student's role, is that right? Correct. Teacher, student advocate, leadership, teacher, VISTA, um, the therapists. Uh, uh, Multi-language learners or special yeah. education supports. Costs is a flat, currently is on the rental of the actual space from the Community Resource Center. Okay. Um, additional cost for furniture, et cetera. By the school district, uh, construction costs, that's what the total number comes from. And the school district is already funded on the thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Yeah, that answered my question. So, yeah, so yeah thank thing. you. Great. So, I guess, you know, if there's a concern about, we talked a lot about one off funding, <laughs> um, driving sustainability issues, I know that people should say, well, we want but more than this in here. Mm -hmm. Matching the future, right? Yeah, right, right. But programs like that do, I mean, adult ed was the same way when I came into it. I, you know, once you got in and got your feet wet and know, knew where to start kind of pulling funding in, you know, it can be done. So I know that these guys can do it. So I think, I mean, out. It's extremely important. Yeah. Right. And then the other cool thing is they'll be right next door to us, so to adult ed. And so the reality is like, hopefully it'll just funnel people like, okay, they're going into this program. They're not going to make it. Now we'll push them into adult ed and finish school there. So I think it's, it should work. All right. Great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyone have any other questions for any of these guys? <laughs> Forward. Looks like it. Yeah, that was great. Easy. <laughs> Too easy, right? <laughs> and then you. Yeah, yeah sorry. That's why I said thanks, August. You made it easy. And I'll also I'll also clarify that we do have an action item on this uh, in our in our regular meeting that'll that'll be informed by this uh, workshop. So we can today. yes today.
I believe so, isn't it? Isn't it the last action item on the agenda? Yeah. <laughs> You're presenting it. But I but I got I got you but I thought what I got yeah, I, that is yeah. on there. I thought it was just but I guess I guess it could I, be either. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. I think the intention was to give something formal so yeah. that agreements could be prepared for the yeah. next yeah. meeting. But, okay. Yeah, or uh, I think um, one thing to keep in mind uh, is that there's not much time to get a yet and the end of the yeah. um, to get everything sorted out. Yeah. So we, we want to be able to make certain that we can make these decisions by the way and not have any yeah yes right and that was the intent to have something up there so it's not right you're something both not certified yep all right all right um if that's it then i i'll uh any anyone else have anything to add before we close the workshop all right i'll close the uh economic development diversification funding workshop and we'll take a five minute recess and then convene back at three o'clock for our next workshop thank you guys thank you
want to get ready and so at three o'clock. I'm sorry, three o'clock. Right, getting ahead of myself. Like you already think. Maybe it's a wet year. It's a wet year. All right. It's um just after three o'clock, and I will call to order our special workshop on high density housing overlay on potential uh, revisions to eligibility requirements. Uh, all present are uh, everyone who's here for our previous workshop, and I will turn this workshop over to Elisa Martin, our planning and zoning director. Thank Thanks, you. Elisa. Okay, so I apologize for, um, there is a little bit of lack of uh, information in agenda summary. I, I had put together a, just a brief agenda for our workshop today, and those are just four things. So if you want to revise it, it's fine. But what I was thinking we could start talking about uh, first is just reviewing the um, HGHO development projects and where they're at with their build out status and then kind of where they're at with the um, selling of those units and the market uh, units that are on the real estate market. And then going into um, reviewing the original intent of the HGHO program. And then that's where I'm actually gonna ask for some of the commissioners and some of the participants, if that's okay from the audience to speak up if they were um, involved or present during the time when the HGHO was being developed to kind of speak up about what they remember the original intent being. And then um, we could go into just debriefing um, from uh, reviewing the joint workshop that we had in April and the ranking results um, and just kind of summarizing those. And then going into discussing actual potential revisions that we could consider. Um, and I was I'm thinking maybe we'd want to actually do some straw poll. Um, yeah straw pulling on some of those items. So I've got a, a slideshow we can see those on visually so we can get through. So does that sound okay? It does, Elisa, yeah. Okay. All right, so I just wanna share my screen real quick. AOB, it's nice to see that you're back safely. Good to be back safely. I had a terrible cold, and um, it's one of the reasons I'm not there today. I'm giving it one more day to recover. Okay. Okay, so this is something we've been working on for a little while, and I've kind of just now wrapped it up. Even today, I was still getting some more information from um, a couple of realtors who have been involved in some of these uh, HGHO units that have been sold. And then also um, Murphy Flats and Courtney has um, been generous with providing some information on their project too. So these are the HGHO units. This is just a snapshot of the ones that have actually sold or are on the market currently. Um, so total units, uh, well, there's, you can see here, there's four projects and 59, um, units that have been uh, constructed or in, under construction or on the market or sold. And out of those, there's 10 that are unrestricted and 49 um, deed restricted. And then we have um, 20 that have been sold to date. Out of the 49, that's for the deed restricted. Um, and then unrestricted, there's been four sold. Um, some of the units are actually being held and retained by the developer investor, like in the case of um, Peakview. They are holding on to eight and they're renting those out to qualified households. So um, that's one way of this program working out is that if the developer is a local business and they, they want to retain those housing units and just rent them, they can do that. Um, so then... As far as pricing, some of these are, you know, back from 2021, and so the, the real estate market's changed quite a bit. Um, but back in 2021, I think is when the Starbucks um, home, one of theirs sold for 350, and then there's a range of Murphy Flats units that are uh, listed between 260 and 355. 
And then for Peak View, um, those are good, those were sold between 359 and 520. And th these are for the restricted units. Oh, sorry. Um, and then for the qual capacity qualified households, there's 12 currently for Murphy Flats, 12 currently for Peak View. So those kind of correspond with the units that are either sold or under contract. So all in all, I would say, you know, there, it's interesting to note that 20 of the units have sold, um, 11 of them have been retained by the developers and are being rented out to qualified households. So like 31, approximately 31 out of the 49 um, units are kind of through the process and there's qualified um, buyers or owners or renters in those units. And then, um, and then with these numbers, are these because uh, some of them are under contract before they're ready to be moved in? Right. In the case of Murphy Flats, that's um, they're doing pre sales. So um, the down here at the bottom of this is kind of their status and when they expect to have these units finished. And so, kind of 10 per month until October, and all of them should be finish that's kind of their goal but yes the ones that have their sold or under contract are are not finished yet but it will be soon so do we know how many are like uh, of all the projects are completed and ready for someone to move in that, that have not been sold have not been sold well it would just be a matter of looking at so that the number here for Murphy Flats that the units have been sold is 13 deed restricted and then um, one that's unrestricted and then there's one that's retained by the developer investor so 15 altogether are gone through like basically a purchasing process or under contract so that the remaining of those so out of 37 you just have to subtract but could you move into those tomorrow or are they yeah so i guess the question was are there complete completed you know move intervals units that have I haven't sold? there are oh of the of the yeah other the hdho units that are the other developments like starbucks hawks um peak view those are all yeah people are moved are moved in for the most part there's one like down here at the bottom, so three of the Hawks subdivision, three homes are built and occupied, and there's one vacant lot, for example. And then the Starbucks, one home is built and there's one vacant lot. So the Starbucks one is actually the one built and sold, and there's a second home, an accessory dwelling built unsold. The ADU. Oh, okay. So the, it's it's been built out. So there, so there's no vacant lot on no vacant lot. Okay, on so that was that's old information. Okay, I'll update update our spreadsheet on that. So both both of those units have been built on totally. Okay. So out of the fifty nine units, there's one ADU that somebody could move into tomorrow. It's not called for. It's one ADU, one ADU, and the the main house also. Okay, they're both vacant. Okay. So right. Oh, I see what you're saying. So yeah, right now existing um, homes that are moving into ready that are HGHO, I think there's probably two right now. So um, without the Murphy Flats, they're not built. Um, what is the timeline on Murphy Flats? So 10, they expect to have 10 units finished by July of this year, 10 in August. I'm sorry, I see it. They're not yeah. sorry. They're <laughs> so fully built out in mid October. Any other questions on this spreadsheet? Okay, so the next one shows all the units that um, have not been built out. They're not constructed yet. Um, they're at various stages, but they're really close to breaking ground. Um, I would say the furthest one out from that is Peak View because they do have to go through their approval tonight for their amended development agreement and their final plat extension. So if that goes through, then they would be 
um, moving full speed ahead with their phase two final plot, which they've already submitted to us just to get it going. But now we haven't got too far processing that one because um, we're not sure if it's going to be approved. So, um, and then Desert Soul, they just had some little changes with their civil plans that they've gotten. They've had to kind of go back and forth with our engineer and that's finalizing it like now. Um, so they're going to be ready to record and uh, post their bond for the improvements. Ugate Terrace, they did get all of that done. So their they're, um, bonding is in and they're going to be in process with finalizing their building permit and uh, starting on their public improvements. And then Manderfield, that was just approved, I think it was just last month or eight in April. And um, so that final plot's going, to, that's all done. They're just probably gonna be starting to work on their public improvements. And Community Rebuilds is the last one that has, um, they were in process when the litigation started. And so um, they were told that they had to put everything on hold while the lawsuit was happening or lawsuits. So that so now they're starting to pick up again, and we've been processing their um, application straight forward as well. And what's the address on the community rebuilds project? Um, Which one? I, one is on San Juan Drive, and there's another project on Lands Ave, and there are two. I think there are two units each. Yeah. Or so. Yeah. So there's still 253 total units that haven't been um, built. And of those, two, 204 are going to be restricted units. So there's quite a bit that we haven't seen hit the market yet. So moving on to HGHO original intent. Um, whoops. I guess I'd just like to maybe open it up for discussion and see if any of you have, I know Kevin was around <laughs> during this time and I can't remember who else. Yeah, I think Mary and Evan were on the commission at the time. Yeah. For sure, Kevin was planning commission. Yeah. I, I was not. And this is something that, you know, Jacques and I talked a little bit about and requested that Elisa bring to the commission because I do think it's it would be good to revisit like. What what kicked I, us all off. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, exactly. what kicked us all off, so. Mary? I think the original intent was to find a path forward. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, it was to find a path forward for people who work and live in Grand County to be able to buy and own a home. That was the original intent and to make sure that it was, uh, it was written in a way and we re recognized that one of the drawbacks why people couldn't afford homes was the cost of land. So the idea of making it so that there would be higher density so that the, the cost of the land would go down just because there would be more houses on you know, an acreage. And so that was very much the intent. There were countless meetings with the planning department and with the commission with many citizens concerns real a lot of citizens concerns that uh, there you know that was the finding where we were comfortable allowing high density to happen was a big deal because and you know just some places were really opposed to it and we had lots of public outcry and other places they weren't so much so so that to me is the summary of the original intent so it was to make housing available for people who live and work in moab but it was also in that process was set up to protect neighborhoods yeah um yeah i guess i would just add to that that i i think we in addition the you know home ownership we also had rental opportunities in mind that i think that was very much part of the discussion yes um and um you know i guess it was a compromise of sort you know the, the program was kind of neutral between those two things you know individuals you know so we just figured the market would decide between you know ownership opportunities and rental opportunities 
Um, I, I think another, it wasn't just cost of land. I, I think you know, my main memory is that you know, the, the feeling at the time was that demand for second homes was driving up prices. Yes. And so we wanted to create a housing market that was separate from um, you know, the unrestricted homes and that hopefully you know, the prices either would be lower or at least they wouldn't be quite as high as they would have been otherwise. And that I, I think it was recognized that, that that was an experiment. You know, there aren't a whole lot of other communities that have done that, and there wasn't a whole lot of data. But we, we sort of figured it couldn't hurt. Um, so that um, that was also, I think, a big part of the discussion. And then something a, a little more obscure, but I remember a conversation in a planning commission meeting when we were talking about, um, you know, just who, who who's being targeted. Like, you know, what what are the the eligible households will be and there did begin to be you know asking what about people who are you know too old to work you know there's all these you know non-workers but people still we felt you know deserved a chance to um you know to have some assistance with with housing costs and and i think the response it probably came from zachariah is that you know this isn't you know we're, we're not tar targeting everyone you know we're targeting very specifically also you know workforce because that's um you know, the, there's, the, I guess, the, the collateral effects of housing costs. Also, it makes it hard for businesses to hire people. It makes it hard for local governments to hire police officers. And, and, and that was very much in our mind at the time. And so I think there was a deliberate, deliberate decision at the time to target it more narrowly to, to workforce as opposed to, you know, other people who aren't technically yeah. working. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. You have um, I would just echo some of those points that this was really developed as a workforce housing project. Um, it was at the time the office was the same office as the economic development department. And um, it wasn't just to support the families in our community, but we were getting a lot of uh, cries for help by local businesses and not just in the tourism industry but across all the sectors and there was a lot of people you know why can't we spend trt money on housing why can't we develop it this way so it was a, it was a creative way to really address the economic factors um, that were stifling workforce and i think another thing worth really remembering is that um it was not popular. Um, we had a lot of meetings because there wasn't a lot of support for it. The mapping exercises involved, um, no one really supported this in their backyard and it was hard to, to get a map approved. It was hard to find different areas. And um, the fact that it was a, a bargaining chip of like that, what are we exchanging, um, you know, in return from turning our rural areas into urban areas, um, it was not popular. The first time it came up for a vote, it did fail. Um, and so I, I think the commitment to uh, really fighting for workforce housing is, is what, um, and I helped get it over the finish line at the end. That incentive being there couldn't be carrot. Yeah, because a lot of people didn't want increased density. I mean, it. Uh, we were probably hearing more comments about not wanting it in people's backyards than anything else. Much more so. Yeah there was much more kickback against it than there was support for it. And it was, but one of the commissioners that was on the commission at the time, Curtis Wells, was really liked the idea because he felt like this, we weren't setting the price, that it was going to be driven by, you know, what people could afford instead of low income housing where you say you have to make this much money to qualify. So it was never original. The intent of the HDO was not for low income housing. That right. was not the intent. We were excited because we had a Royal Crossing. 
which took us a lot longer to get over the finish line than we ever expected. But uh, we felt like we were addressing affordable housing through a royal crossing. But there would be a lot of people in the community that wouldn't qualify for a royal crossing because they don't make, you know, it wasn't low enough. So uh, this was to fill that gap for the people that made too much money for a royal crossing but not enough money to compete with compete with second homes. And I think that that's that really speaks to the amendment too, and the need to clarify some of that was that um, that it was an attempt, or there was a, a lot of thought put into eliminating that competition from outside uh, forces you know, in terms of the ownership, the rentability, you know, who is this program really serving? Um, you know, that that, that was uh, something we also had to really wrestle over. Right. Bill, you look like you had something to say. Yeah, I, I agree that it wasn't very popular in the beginning, but I would say that it still isn't popular with the neighbors, the developers, or the people trying to get in them. There needs to be some work done to this. It isn't popular anywhere. Nobody's excited about the HDHO and saying, oh, can I have one? Because it's so strict that if one of the people lives on the wrong side of the line or if they work in San Juan, I mean, it is so restrictive that we're not finding people to get into them. It's a real struggle for the developers, and I've got one, but... I know that some of these guys that have got the bigger numbers, and that's part of the reason that it's so slow moving forward is that, that there just aren't people that it's so restrictive. There's not enough people to fill it. And that's not, you know, it was a unique program. We didn't have a roadmap. And that we're here today to improve it means that's how new, you know, the often happens with new ideas and new programs that you have to tweak them later. I, th I think just with the note taking around the intent, um, I would agree that it was the intent was to be strict in the sense that we really wanted a laser focus on who was getting at these. And so I think that, you know, a statement like the program is too strict is kind of getting outside the bubble of what the intent is. I see. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I'll, I'll say if the program was strict and therefore not very popular, which is kind of exactly what you said originally, Evan, was that um, it was designed to be restrictive. And, and then there's the high density issue, which made it not very popular. Yeah, a little bit more on that. I, I think there was a lot of discussion about, you know, for the various rules about, you know, whether the system could be gamed, you know, would, um, and and so I think in in drawing the line, you know, we were thinking about it like in practical terms, in terms of, like enforceability as opposed to just sort of in the abstract. So it was because I think if you look at other subsidized housing programs around the country, it's, it's like you know, rent, areas of rent control. You know, it's pretty common for you know that not to hit the targeted population because the the incentive you know, there's just a very high incentive to you know get a, a lower price unit. So. As far as the original intent goes, is are there any planning commissioners who were on at the time who had a different take on uh, things um, or wanted to add something to what's already been put out there? I did. I I just wanted to say I I've listened to this with interest. Uh, Kevin and I were both on the planning commission at the time. I think you've got it uh about right the only thing i'd add is you know at the time it was the same discussion we have today what are we going to do with school teachers police officers all kinds of folks kind of in those cat those type of categories it we realized it was not a affordable housing project we realized it wouldn't pro you know not that they aren't well i guess they might not be eligible depending how long they work but it was not a program that was going to solve uh, people who are working here during the tourist season, et cetera. And I think I agree with the kind of description of who it was for, how it was aimed. It was definitely workforce. 
it was def we definitely realized it couldn't target all of the workforce, kind of the transient folks. Um, and uh, it did have, it was strict, but it was strict for a reason. Um, and I think actually we will be discussing how successful in comparison to other kind of projects it is uh, during this meeting. Okay. Um, one other thing I wanted to add this on a little bit different subject. Um, there was a lot of debate when we were drafting this about about the map, basically, like, you know, how the, we have these eligibility po polygons, which you know, in the version of PASC go pretty far south in the Spanish Valley, and, and we're very quite a lot of area. Um, and I, on the planning committee, I, I was someone who was in, in favor of, you know, smaller, you know, trying to make it all closer to town. And the counter argument, which prevailed, um, you know, was that yeah, you know, we just we want to make sure that we get enough uptake. You know, there had been a previous program similar to this. I think it's you see an echo of it in our the old MFR zone, and no one no one ever took advantage of those density bonuses, even though they're available for years. And and I think there was there was quite a bit of uncertainty, and and I think the people worried that if we didn't make lots of properties eligible for this, we just weren't going to get enough takers to you know fill our quota. And then it turned out, you know, everyone was kind of surprised that it turned out to be a very popular with developers, um, at least initially, and and that we hit our quota of three hundred much quicker than anyone anticipated. So, in the sunset. All right. That, that, does that uh, anyone else have any comments on original intent? Mike, uh, just to tie into original intent. I, I agree. We, you guys, during the time, uh, hit that three hundred quota, but even to this point of only fifty nine build out, uh, I, I expect uh, to hear those incoming hurdles or why it's going so slow. Because yes, the quota was hit at three hundred, but I mean, total fifty nine. I mean. And they're not even technically built yet. I mean, right. they're expected in the next couple of months. That's a that's a far different bar there. Yeah, I think there's a variety of reasons, and we've kind of gone over them. But I would say, well, Mary, did you have? Something? I was going to say we well, we had a lawsuit which brought it to a complete halt for an extended period of time. So there was about a year. We can't say that it was being that anything could happen. And we had COVID. So the fact that we're five years, or I think five, six years. Well, 2019 uh, is when it was adopted. Okay, so four years. So four years with uh, a lawsuit and COVID. And staff turnover. And staff turnover. That in ways, it's only been two years. Uh, you know, if you took out the lawsuit and you took out COVID, it's, uh, you know, there's things that slowed it down uh, out I, of our, out if, of our if that thought process, though, that would mean there's 30 or 40 or 50 people waiting through those two or three years of COVID and everything else, and they're not there. Yeah, so that, but I mean, I'm saying there's two years, it's been five years. It's been five years with some obstacles that we could not change. We could not do anything about COVID. We couldn't do, you know, we had to wait for the lawsuit to work out. So I think that to me, the objective of this piece was to talk about the original right, intent, right. not to start going, you know, down a rabbit hole as to what's what's wrong. Or I, we, we wanted to hear from the people that were around at that time and what the goal at that time was. So I, I think we should, I think we should move on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for all of that. It's great. Um, all right. So this was the results from our joint workshop. This was kind of a, our best, uh, at our best ability to kind of rank all of these. It was a little complicated that with the way that exercise turned out. But um, my next slide, uh, there's a slide below that shows some of the nuances because a lot of people and participants in that workshop actually wrote notes and kind of had their own like modifications to each of these. And so we'll, we'll go through that. But this is just kind of a overall um, ranking of the, uh, the results or the, the um, eligibility requirements. 
So up at the top, you know, the ones that we already have in the in the program in, in the land use code um, works full time, 30 hours or more. And for a business based in Grand County, that was still very popular. Um, at least one adult member of the household qualifies as an AEH, but not necessarily making up 50% of the household. So that would be a revision. And that was a popular idea to, to but, make that. Revision. But in the example in parentheses, that, that's sorry, if that 50% only applies to unrelated adults. So if it's a. Right. Oh, yeah, we did, we did modify that. Um, at the planning commission, we went into this one a little bit further, and I should have um, updated that in parentheses. There was some, there was another example that um, was brought up at the planning commission where they were unrelated but still the same household. And then there was kind of the conversation of how we define household. Should, maybe we should define that better in the land use code. Too. But but I but I think the you know what's in the ordinance right now is one member of a family, you know, of related adults, whatever that means, or 50% if it's a household of un unrelated adults, right. I mean, that's what it says. Does it? Okay. I think so. Maybe. I was hoping you would I, correct me. I think this came up from some, one of the public comments, that, or a few of the public comments that were made, and um, I don't know, is Caitlin here? Oh, sure. she, she actually made that comment, because they do it a little bit differently, I guess. Um, but maybe we can ask her when she comes back about that and clarifying that. Um, so then remote worker employed by a company serving more than 75% local clients. That was also popular, but that one had notes for modifying and possibly um, revising. And the same for the self-employed working out of their home serving uh, more than 75% local clients. That one also had some modifications suggested. And then works full time, 30 hours or more per week for a business based in San Juan County. This one was also modified to, to limit the area in San Juan County just to the zip code of 84532. So that's, um, this would definitely be a big um, revision if everybody wanted to go forth with that. Um, and then so on, these were the other, you know, somewhat popular was works part time but has established residency, so less than 30 hours a week. This would definitely be starting to kind of um, take away from the original intent maybe of like the, the full-time worker, but um, so it was definitely something we talked about a lot at that workshop. Um, retired or not currently employed in Grand Juan, in San Juan counties. Um, I think this one is already in our, in the code. I think it already is allowed. Um, but not the San Juan County not, part. Not San Juan. Yeah. That would be a change there. Like, yeah. And then these other ones, um, established resident, this is basically just kind of simplifying the eligibility requirement down to something very, very probably pretty different than what the original intent was, um, but could be encompassing the, the, retire, the retiree. The, retire, the retiree. Well, um, eligibility requirement is probably just the more specific one. Um, yeah, and then it goes on down to these were brought up, but not as popular with everybody in the room. Um, have having children enrolled full time in Grand County schools, and and that being the only requirement, um, and owns a business in Grand County. Oh, this was the this was the modification to the one above, and then oops. The not so popular ones were um, a remote worker employed by a company serving less than 75% local clients and uh, self-employed working out of their home with less than 75% local clients. And then for seasonal workers, most people disagreed that that would be, um, that, that would make you eligible for HGHO as well as college students. Any questions about these results? Yeah, th there was another proposal, which I, it, I don't know if it's part of the agenda because it's not part of the AEH definition, but this is um, it, it concerns like ownership of apartment buildings and just, yes, so is, that's coming, coming up. up. Okay, yes. great. Thanks. Next slide. 
So the other part of the workshop was discussing the ownership requirements for investors, developers, uh, multifamily developments, and ADUs. So um, we brought up the idea that um, it's it's kind of pro prohibitive for projects, bigger developments to be built without the investment capital from outside of the area. So one of the suggestions was to remove the requirement for developers and investors who are building the project to be um, so that they don't have to be qualified, qualified as AEH. And most agreed with that. So then another one was um, removing ownership restriction for multifamily apartment developments. Um, so the units are obviously going to still be restricted for occupancy, but the owner or manager developer of a multifamily develop, um, project would not have to be qualified as a local AEH. And most agree with that as well. There was some discussion on that, though. Just the concern was um, that you would have possibly landlords that would be from out of the area and kind of not caring as much about their property. It was something that to think about. Um, accessory dwelling units need not be AEH restricted. There was a big question mark here because um, most there were just really a split opinion about this. There was probably half and half, I would say. And at the Planning Commission, we talked about this as well. And I think we were, we ended up being somewhat undecided there too. So having your input on this tonight would be great. Um, and then the other suggestion that, was, suggestion that was brought up at the workshop was to simply remove the ownership requirement altogether and only require HGHO units to be restricted for occupancy. And a few suggested this, but um, there was not a full consensus at that workshop. No. And right now, isn't the criteria determined at the time of sale? Yes. So there's no, like, they're not checking every month to see who's in the unit. The, um, the occupants. Month, but Laura annual, yeah. So Hasu does an annual review to check in on the occupants, their eligibility. Okay. Um, okay. So then, some of the potential revisions to eligibility requirements that were. Um, Kind of discussed and these are the modifications that were su suggested in writing on the exercise so for the remote worker employed by a company serving more than 75 percent local clients some suggested that we should remove the percentage requirement altogether and just allow remote workers to uh, qualify as AEH um, and then the other option was no percentage requirement but minimum three years of taxes paid in the area and then the other idea was to lower the percentage to 50 percent and that's basically the same for the self-employed working out of their home with more than 75 percent local clients and this one the self-employed uh hypothetical person we've had a couple of those um and one of one particular one working with hasu uh, was really struggling to provide the information and would not be able to qualify based on um, this 75% or more local clients, but they you know, have worked and been part of the community for um, I think over a decade and uh, you know, work online providing services, but not all of their clients are within Grand County. So that was one that I think you know, had some more consideration for sure. So at this point, let's see. Oh, the other the other one was lendability that we talked about. And once we have this discussion again at Planning Commission, um, and we reached out to the to some of the mortgage companies again, um, it seems like what's happening with the um, with this the HDHO rules and regulations that were amended. Um, include these exceptions. So I'm, I've reached out again to some folks to find out if this does uh, make it possible for uh, folks to get 
Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans. Um, and I just I haven't gotten a final answer, but this is something that sounds like it might not be a factor. Well, and there were actual units um, from the Peak View development that those folks did get loans to those institutions. So we're looking into that a little bit more, but it might not be a high priority. Right. Yeah. Um, so I was going to go back and see if you would like to go through each of these or maybe choose some of the more low hanging fruit, more obvious ones and straw poll vote. Really quick, Elisa, would it be possible to bring Laura up for just a few minutes? Is that possible, Laura? Sorry to put you on the spot. And maybe you could just just articulate it, you know, any stumbling blocks that you see or any, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to ask for your recommendations, but sure. maybe I will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would just basically say that I, um, out, of, out of the folks that I have, qualified who have gone through the qualification process with me, um, I have only denied one person. So I don't know if that's because more folks are funneling through prior to the application process. Um, I know we have been saying it's like pretty strict, but it does seem to me that at least the folks who are going to apply for these units are very aware of what the qualifications are and if they are able to Occupy or yeah, and then the one that was denied was that the one that the remote worker, but but a resident, a long term resident. Okay, yeah, okay, and so that so far that's me. Okay, um, I would say there have been small kind of uh, I don't know what you would call it, maybe administrative um, kind of gaps that I've been noticing. As we're going through the process, I think one of the biggest concerns, and this is not super relating to, um, you know, like the eligibility definition, but one issue that I'm finding is we're having folks who I qualified um, with intent to purchase, and then they close on the sale and we're not notified. And so we don't have any way to track when it was closed, um, if they actually followed through with it. And so I think that's a major concern. Um, for the program as it is expanding. Um, and then there are a couple other smaller, um, I guess, pieces of the land use code that I think uh, it's in rules of drinks that should probably be um, off the I don't know if I remember right. them off the top of my head. But yeah, I, I think those are kind of the main points that I would speak to. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Does the number look right here? The 28 is like the total that you between Peakview and Murphy Plots that you qualified. Oh, and I think two. since we last spoke, I would say there's maybe four or four. Okay, maybe so maybe you have more 32 or 33 um, total qualified. Yeah, because like with, with Peakview, there's the own, the developer is the owner, but I've been qualified documents. Right. So that number is because we okay. met a couple weeks ago, whatever. Lots of you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I think the other thing that I would say is that it's a little bit of 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 the program, has anyone ever provided any types of notices of lapse of employment or leaves of absences under the codes? So, okay. Has has there been any report of that occurring? And do they know? Of, know. Right. Do they know of the requirement to continue? Because there is a notice requirement, even though it it's going to trigger on the sale of course, but it also triggers on some event happening. So, for example, under the under the rules and regs, it says temporary lapses of employment. Of more than three months shall be reported to HASU and then leaves of absence, it says three months or less. So there is a requirement for continuing notification to HASU about these. Yeah, I haven't received it. Okay. Um, I'm kind of just getting into time of year where it will be time for me to reevaluate um, annual compliance. And I'm also playing around with 
uh, if that's just going to happen for everybody for like a one month period of time. So it's not um, staggered throughout the year. So again, it's those kind of administrative um, upkeep of the program. Now that it's off the ground, what are the gaps and holes? Uh, yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Laura? It's about quarter to four. We have to start a regular meeting to four. So maybe um, getting started with some of these, uh, just taking the temperature here. On the yeah, I, I guess I, I think Elisa's suggestion was that there's a commissioner who thinks that one of the suggestions might be at a majority in a straw poll. They should bring it up and we can. That's great. Have that straw poll. Yeah. So, so one that comes to mind for me is the um, 84532 zip code. Right. Expanding it to that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I personally I lean towards supporting that. It's, you know, it's the same housing market. It's the same job market. It doesn't really make sense to draw a line there. Um, same aquifer. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. Anyone object to including the uh, northern San Juan, so basically eight four five three two zip code, into the AEH requirements? I mean, my. My reason is that of not supporting it is we get a lot of pushback saying that Grant County should stay on their side of the road and San Juan County stays on their side of the road. It's not unusual that in many of our dealings within the county that there's this arbitrary imaginary line where things stop. And I don't really see this as different than a lot of our other um, things that go with that. I mean, the businesses that are operating on the south side of that line, you know, they're not contributing to EMS and our sheriffs and all these sorts of things um, that, you know, we would ask to. And so I would hate to see an opportunity, not that I'm saying this exists, but where somebody would strategically decide to open their business in San Juan County, knowing that that there was, you know, housing opportunities within Grand County. So it's not that far-fetched in my mind. And so because we do so many other things with the imaginary line in the sand, I'm fine with keeping that imaginary line in the sand. Anyone else have a comment on that particular uh, issue? Um, I mean, I, I a lot of things you mentioned are things I've thought about. And, you know, initially I, I was hesitant. Uh, I, I think they're valid points, but I... I to me, there's just arguments on the other side. Um, I, I think, you know, we can't say that San Juan County is not doing its fair share of providing housing. You know, they've got, you know, a lot of housing going up there. Um, so, but, but I guess one thing I do wonder is, you know, there, one could imagine future negotiations where, you know, I, 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 in the future, I, I would like to see planning and things like that more coordinated throughout all of Spanish Valley. And, um, and we need some bargaining chips and that thing. So I don't know if this will be a bargaining chip, but still, I, I, I think it on balance. I'm, so I, I recognize your points, but I'm not. All right, Mike, do you have something to add to that? Yeah. Uh, first one that comes to mind is LaGrand, or at least the gravel pits. There's a lot of workers and they contribute to everything and they always have. I mean, be it sports, be it schools, be it anything. I mean, one of the largest employers out there. Uh, uh, that's our that's our valley. I mean, it always has been. You're you're working in Moab if you work in the Grand. The the thing that it's not just like should San Juan County employees live in Grand County. It should Grand County urbanize its rural areas and have higher densities to support San Juan County businesses. And that's that's all I was saying. You're right. I'm not trying to discount the value of San Juan employees in Grand County. All right. I'll just take a super quick hand count of who's in favor of Kevin's uh, proposal to include the uh, 84532. All right. So it looks like it's a pretty favorable uh, path forward. Anyone else want to bring another uh, one of these up? So, I, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so I think another one that I don't think I've heard any objections to is or concerns the ownership of multifamily units, like an apartment building. You know, I would 
let's say, you know, fourplex or more, four or more units. Um, I, to me, it, it doesn't make sense to restrict the, the ownership of that. Um, and I don't think that's something that got a lot of, I, I was kind of surprised after, you know, after it was all done to realize that, you know, some people were interpreting things that way. And I, and I think probably the way things are written, that is true, but I, I think that was kind of personal. I think that was inadvertent that it came out that way. Um, so I guess, I guess I would propose that if it's a multifamily unit or four or more units that, um, we don't have a, an ownership restriction, but occupancy, but yes, yeah, yeah, still have, still, still have it at the occupancy, but so basically, you know, we don't care who owns the apartment building. We just care who, who lives there, but so, it, it, this would not apply to individual, like right. individual condos or yeah. that kind of thing. So, so, so fourplex and greater, basically four, fourplex and greater is yeah. what I'm that are not sold individually. Right. right. That are not sold. Right. Rental. Yes. Rental units. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that seems pretty reasonable to me. Anyone have a counterpoint to that or, or support? I would be okay with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Um, anyone else? <laughs> we have to remove the requirement for de the developer investor. So this is only just to clarify, this would be for the developer who's actually um, building the project, not like somebody who might be owning it later. That's mm -hmm. But it, this would be more for like larger projects. Like we have the we have this problem with Fugate and it was Desert Soul as well, where they were changing ownership. Um, so mm. it was going through a sell, a transaction where it would trigger the AEH requirement. I see. But the developer, the person, the, the entity buying it was the developer who was going to be building it. So an example would be like if the, the Peak View folks wanted to sell to someone who lives in Colorado or something like that, but continued the project. Right. Yeah, no, I, I guess I, for a, I I would also be in favor of removing that that restriction. Um, it, I think it kind of goes goes along so with with the other. Right. Yeah. The the thing that gets me with that is when we were doing the mapping exercises, people were really um, concerned about folks pushing to get their property included, and then we even saw in um, the real estate papers after it was adopted that properties were being identified as um, HDHO eligible and that um, by having that overlay applied to it uh, that it somehow drove up the value of the the property which is not helping uh, keep them low cost. Yeah, but but I, I also think you know if we we drew those big eligibility polygons, you know, in the I think you know, the parcels we were thinking most about are you know, maybe ten acres in Spanish Valley that you know could be developed. A lot of those ten acre parcels are owned by people who don't live here, and I don't think we were meaning to exclude that you know sort of out of town owner from applying for HDHO and you know building some houses or whatever. So I I just I, I don't. To me, it doesn't seem like it's a problem if the if the person who's doing the developing um, is is not a re resident as, as long as you know the eventual ownership of individual units or you know the rentals are still going to locals. All right, all in favor of that proposal? I'm not sure. Okay. It looks like we do have five who were in favor of that. So I'd go ahead and yeah, take that as a as a yes. Um so we only have five minutes left in this. Do you guys want to is there if, if there's any other like pressing ones that you guys think would be important? Right. Or we could also uh we we could continue this, you know, maybe do another workshop the next meeting. I don't I don't know. What 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 do you guys think about that? Any, any yeah, opinion? I, I think we should continue the. Yeah, I, I mean, so. I mean, I've I've run out of things that I'm in favor of. I right. but but I think if 
you know, we don't want to not do something just because there wasn't time in this right. discussion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we should yeah. bring it up again. I agree with that. You did a really good job. I appreciate backtracking and getting that original intent. And thank you guys so much for giving us that because I think we needed that context right. to make decisions that yeah, are appropriate. I, for me, I think that, uh, you know, we have one empty unit with an ADU that's ready to be moved into. We've had one denial on right. a remote worker. I think that the, the problems that need more addressing is this awaiting final plat extension approval, finalizing changes to civil plans, building permit in process, in process with public improvements, in process with zoning district application. This row in the spreadsheet seems like more what needs to be addressed than what zip code somebody works in. So rather than continuing to hash out that side of things, I'd rather move down to this corner of the spreadsheet. Well, and on that note, with the public improvements, that's really on the developer's timeline, but it, we also do have it. We have to have those done within two years of the final plat approval. So there is a strict deadline for those to be finished. And I think it's, you know, just all each project had a different timeline when they finalized their final plat, where that um, clock started to tick. My point is, I don't believe there's a shortage of eligible workforce yeah. in our county that is you know being blocked out of this but it's all the other kind of factors that are going in. correct we have yeah it's our construction economy and mm -hmm. yeah inflation so do you want do you see value in adding that conversation to our next workshop i guess that would be the question uh i don't see much need to continue to look at the eligibility question okay. right but yeah I, I okay yeah I'd like to look at the other hangups great no, not for sure okay thank okay. you Lisa. All right. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think that's pretty clear. And then, and then continuing with another workshop at uh, <laughs> uh, right on top of us. <laughs> keep, keep the ball rolling in another workshop at three at three o'clock and another hour workshop at our next commission meeting. Does that sound reasonable to everybody? Is uh, would that second uh, time? Uh, yeah. Right, right. If that's time to, well, I don't know if the planning commission would be involved in that or if that's more of like administrative stuff. Um, it, yeah, that, but, I would ask you uh, that, Elisa. Is that, does that seem like a reasonable time frame? So we could kick it forward. I, I will good. say that I'm not going to be here for the July 5th meeting. I'll be, I'll be gone. And, and I know that's a tough time for a lot of staff. Traditionally, that's been a super, uh, short meeting because a lot of people take vacations and whatnot this time of year um the next meeting on june 20th would that be that's the one i was talking it's, about originally. enough time yeah. for you I think that's right cool. yeah. it is okay yeah. i think okay. i think we should do that be far along in, in everything that we've been working on collecting and information great yeah okay so we'll just keep rolling with it all right thank you. Okay, thank you all right i'll adjourn this um special workshop hdho uh potential reasons uh, revisions to eligibility requirements, and uh, we'll take a couple of minutes and come back and start our regular meeting.
Yeah. All right, everyone. It's um, it's four minutes after four o'clock, so I will uh, get our regular Grand County Commission meeting rolling. All present are those who are here for the workshops, and we also have the addition of our county attorney, Mr. Stocks. Um, all right. I'll rise for Pledge of Allegiance, please. All right, I'll open up a uh, session of citizens to be heard. Um, if you are here in the chambers, you'd like to come forward to make a comment, please come to the front and uh, introduce yourself and uh, you can make a comment. Hi, Courtney. Hi. Um, I'm Courtney Kaiser, one of the developers at Murphy Flats, and I just have a few things that I'd like y'all to keep in mind for your future workshops on this conversation. Uh, the first are the reasons about how we got here and this thought that the, the fact that so many units have been built is because of a few reasons. COVID is not one of them. Construction has been positively booming, and housing construction in other places has been on fire. Every other kind of development except for this program has been to the wall. Um, the second is the lawsuit. I still don't understand that argument. It literally took three months out of our, our project process. So if those reasons aren't why this hasn't continued forward at a decent pace, you have to ask yourself why, because those are not the reasons. Um, staff turnover is absolutely one of them. And that's because all of these developers base their performance and their designs on the guidance of a particular staff, the staff that wrote the program. And whether or not you want to believe this, the rug was swept out from all of us when the program changed. I know that that's not great to hear, but that is genuinely what happened when the ownership got changed from being anybody as long as the occupant was the person that had to meet the requirements to the owner and the occupant that drastically changes your pro forma. So please keep that in mind, regardless of whether or not you want to return to the ownership not being a requirement, you need to have that in mind as to why this program was so popular at the beginning. That's what the developers signed up for. Um, and I think you also need to ask yourself, it's easy to say only one applicant hasn't been approved, only one unit isn't filled. We're talking 32 applicants in a population of 10,000 people. There is there is something that is not working. If that's the number of applicants and you're gonna look at that and say, this is a success, 99% approval rate. Um, how many people pre-selected out? How many people look at those restrictions and they're like, you know, never mind, that's not gonna work for me. So there's still 200 and something units. You're gonna have to think about how to make those work for everybody. And then specifically for Murphy Flats, the timeline that we are running up against is in order to keep these lendable through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, no one owner can own more than 10 for units. For Murphy Flats, that means three units. That means we don't get to hold on to however many we don't sell and just rent them. It means they will sit empty until they sell so that we can maintain the lendability on the project. And that matters. So help us get these units sold so that they can be occupied by the people that you want them to be occupied by. And I don't necessarily think the definition of AEH has to change, but then the ownership requirement needs to go back to what it was. Or maybe it's just for condos and apartments, pro projects that are big enough that this matters. It doesn't matter as much for single family to maintain ownership. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Anybody else care to come forward and make comment at this time in the chambers? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Caitlin. Uh, my name is Caitlin Myers. I, I just, since I just happened to go to the bathroom at the exact moment that I was called, 
Um, I'll address what was talked about in the workshop. Um, for us at Arroyo Crossing, related to the 50% household requirement, we just require one person in the household. I was just talking to Elisa outside. Um, so even if it's a household of unrelated people, most likely, even if you keep that 50% requirement, if it's a person that's going to have a bunch of roommates, whether it's 50% or one person, that one person is going to be on the loan. So the way that we handle it with MACLT is we have one person that is required to meet our household eligibility requirements. And then we do the same annual affidavit uh, compliance that HGHO requires that Laura is going to be working on. Um, for us, we only require continuous primary residency. We once once you get qualified for an Arroyo Crossing unit with our income limits and our uh, employment requirements, once you're in the home, that is your home, and you just have to continue to live in it as a primary resident and meet that requirement. Um, if you have roommates, so if you're a, a one person that's no, going to walk into that home and have a bunch of roommates, we require that we have leases and we have income and employment information for every person that is renting. Um, for us, our homeowners have to continue to qualify under primary residency, but any renter, whether it's in an individual home or in an apartment or at a road crossing, has to meet, continuously meet all of our requirements. So, so that's our way of catching you know, if someone has a bunch of roommates or, you know, if, if there are a bunch of unrelated people living in a household under individual leases, that's our way of continuing to check in on whether all of the people in the household are uh, eligible or not. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to address that. That's, we just do one person in the household. It's, it's still going to be a really simple way for us to catch and make sure that that household as an entire entity, whether it's a family or unrelated people, is going to qualify. So, yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Caitlin. Mm -hmm. Citizens to be heard. Anybody else uh, here care to come forward? Do we have anyone on Zoom? Let me see. Anyone? Let's see anybody raising their hand? All right. Last call, citizens to be heard. Okay, we will move on to presentations, uh, of which we have none, and we have uh, department reports. We will start with personal services 2023 presentation, Renee Baker. Um, I will go back and share my screen. After three years of using Zoom. Right, ready to go. In the do. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I am Renee Baker, I'm the personal services director, so I handle HR functions um, and in risk management functions for the county. Uh, in the first kind of Portion of my presentation, I just included our uh, most up to date county organizational chart, um, the ever evolving, um, recently colorized uh, organizational chart. Um, our mission with Personal Services Department is just to support the employees who are out there providing our public services to our citizens um, and promote a work environment that's inclusive and characterized with open communication and mutual trust. Um, we try to keep performance of the county's mission and keeping our focus on our human resources as our most valuable and valued asset in the county. Uh, so what does my department do? We handle compliance and the employee career cycle, performance management, payroll benefit administration, and risk management and workplace safety. Under compliance, uh, it's communicated to our employees through the employee handbook, but we handle uh, compliance at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, so large amount of laws and regulations that cover all of our human resources practices. Um, the employee life cycle, uh, I recently got to, and I'll get to that at the end of my goals and projects, but I recently got to hire a personal services coordinator um, who just onboarded uh, three weeks ago, and she's in and doing a lot of great things. Uh, but her focus will be kind of at the beginning of the employee's life cycle. So the um, we handle recruitment, onboarding, developing and retaining employees, and then should the employee leave the county, we're going to offer that employee, um, whichever, way, whichever way they, they choose to leave the county. 
Um, performance management, we handle uh, performance reviews. Our employees, all employees are eligible for those yearly um, on their anniversary date. And then we have a paper performance schedule right now that's a milestone increase. And then every other year would be an exemplary increase available to our employees. Um, the exemplary increase requires just a little bit more, uh, more goals and planning outside of their normal job duties. Um, and then we also handle play coaching and discipline. And then, of course, we have an amazing payroll and benefit administrator or benefit coordinator. Um, we transferred payroll into the into my department in 2020 um, and handle all payroll functions there. Uh, some exciting things in, in benefit administration. I won't get into it too much, but Cigna is our current healthcare provider. Uh, we're level funded, so I can, I can go into a little more depth than that usually when we talk about budget numbers. But when our plan runs well, uh, we get a surplus, so a discount on our uh, health insurance plan. And in 2023 or 2022, um, our plan well, ran well enough that we had a surplus of 196000 um, So we get that as a discount on our plan this year, 2023. Um, and then additionally, we handle all of the benefit administration for about 150 full-time employees. And we also include rain, water, and sewer and floor benefit. Risk management and workplace safety. So we handle workers' compensation. And then um, my office in coordination with the clerk's office handles um, liability, property, and all of the insurance. Um, we have a few committees set up to so the Safety and Accident Review Committee. And the workers' comp plans and our insurance has provided us through the trust. Uh, our 2023 workers' comp uh, quote came back. Uh, that's on a April renewal, um, so we actually decided a discount there as well, um, down 11 percent, so the savings of about 16k. Uh, our EMOD is our experience modifier. Experience modifier. That's how the insurance company kind of rates us or credit score per se. Um, Currently trying to get that down close to a one, so then you're not paying an increased premium. Um, so if we can get that down more and more with uh, less claims or, or claims that aren't costing us as much, um, uh, we'll see that number get closer to one and an increase in our annual premium on workers' comp year to year. And 2022, we had six workers' comp claims filed, and that was a total loss of 13,000. Um, no. They're all medical claims, but no lost days from work. So we can go back to work quickly. There's our, our main goal uh, with workers. And then projects and goals going forward uh, training our new personal services coordinator, keeping our focus on employee engagement and retention, that work life and wellness benefits, um, being able to promote our benefit programs is what really can ensure that the employee understands what there's offered to them and drive those costs down a little bit. Um, and then updating performance management. And of course, I should have put the biggest thing on my projects and goals is just uh, updating our employee handbook. And then we have some uh, current full-time positions. So there's an airport landside tech starting at 2433. The county deputy attorney is still open. That starts at 82,000 a year. And then uh, we, we hire for the Sulogs uh, Senior Nutrition Cook at our Grand Center, and that starts at $20 an hour. Uh, there are some part-time positions, and we just added one today that I didn't get added to the sheet, but uh, the Seasonal Invasive Plant Tech, uh, the Seasonal Motorized Trail Ambassador, and then the Summer Trail <coughs> Tech opened up today. So uh, if interested in submitting any type of job application for our public out there, uh, those can only just be emailed. Resumes and cover letters can be emailed to GCHR at Grant County. Yeah, okay, I want to pass. I know you have a long way to do. Are there any questions for me? That's good. Thanks, Renee. That was great. Yeah. Any questions for Renee? Thank you. Thank you. Have a great meeting, guys. All right. Appreciate it. Good luck with onboarding your new assistant. I'm sure yeah. that'll help. Very exciting. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have a library 2023 presentation. And uh, thank you, Carrie. My name is Carrie Valdez. I'm the director of the Grand County Library. Renee set the bar really high. Makes her to be my time. Uh, this is my time assistant director over at the library. She's here to be my time keeper and uh, 
tech support, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. So here in a second, you'll see the library mission statement. Um, Huh? Yeah, that's right. And wasting time, wasting time. Okay, here, here we go. Uh, so this is this is the library's mission statement. This is developed at the library board level. I do have an advisory board of citizens plus a commission representative. Shout out to Trish. Um, everything that we do is based along this mission statement, um, including what we're just getting started on, which is an update of our three to five year strategic plan. Excellent. Uh, we've been around since 1915. Um, obviously, we do a few more hours a week, plus we have a few more items in the library. Currently, we have about 50,000 things for checkout. Um, in I'm not going to bore you to death with statistics, but just super quick here, so you get an idea of exactly how busy the library is. In 2022, we had 85,000 walk-ins. So that's just people literally walking in the front door of either the main library here in Moab or the Castle Valley branch. Of those 50,000 items, um, they circulate about two and a half times statistically. So in 2022, our checkouts were around 120,000 just for physical items. And then um, there was an additional 30,000 checkouts on some of our digital stuff, which I'll talk about here in just a second. In 2022, we had uh, 400, 504 programs with 5,600 attendees throughout the year. So to put that in another perspective, daily, on an open day, we have between 350 to 400 people a day that walk in the library. Um, and then as far as the programs and outreach, well, the programs, so far this year, we've had 262 programs with almost 4,000 attendees. That's just in library programs. We also have an outreach component that I'll talk about as well. So those physical items that I was talking about at the library, um, about a third of them are adult fiction and nonfiction books. About a third are juvenile materials. And then about a third are uh, AV of, of both for, for uh, adults and, and uh, kids. Um, some of the other things, the digital content that I was referring to early, er, Libby is um, through Overdrive. It's a state consortium that we do through the Utah State Library that allows for digital uh, eBooks or e-audio books. All you need is a library card. Um, Mango is a language learning software. Again, free to anybody with a library card. We have an amazing array of historical photos, and Meg has been working very hard to get those into the catalog. So we partnered with the museum and then SUU, SUU and we've got the um, F.A. Barnes collection of historic photos that are, that are accessible through the library's um, online catalog. Uh, Candid is a grants database. It used to be called the Foundation Center Database. Um, we have digital newspapers, as well as Utah's online library, which is a bunch of databases, including things like genealogy, uh, auto repair manuals, that type of stuff available uh, through the state library. And then <clears throat> I'm taking a little more time on this slide because this is the most exciting slide. Um, as far as the outreach, uh, earlier pre-pandemic, Meg was successful in getting a grant for the library on the go. This is what allows us to do such a great job of outreach. We've got this really neat book bike. I don't know if you've seen it in person, but if you haven't, look for us around the community. We also have mobile hotspots, laptops, phone books, and iPads that I'll check out to people with library cards. Um, so that's kind of our digital stuff. We're also, not only are we a community resource, the library is a member of the community. And so we've tried really hard to partner with other organizations in order to expand what we can do as a library. Um, we just had a soft opening of the new teen center that is located over in the old USU extension, uh, the old USU campus. Apparently I'm not supposed to tell the teens, you know, it's next to the liquor store. So. Um, we're working on the we're working on the marketing for that one, but um, it Napa. was a soft Napa. opening. And we will be doing <laughs> yes, exactly. We, we decided that as a better yeah. point of reference. Um, we will be doing a grand opening at some point this summer for that teen center. That is a really neat space. We've got ten computers. We've got gaming consoles. We've got a ping pong table, um, makerspace carts, three D printers. Like it is a really excellent setup for the teens. Some of the other kind of non-traditional things that we do, we have a, gar a hydroponic garden at the library. If you haven't seen that, stop by and take a look. That was a grant that came through us during COVID. 
Um, an outdoor movie system, we partner with um, the Safe Outdoor Living or organization, which I guess is through the um, Homeless Task Force. Um, we provide the shed that has the material for folks that have vouchers if they're in a um, non-traditional housing situation and need some help because we are available more hours throughout the week than most of the organizations. Um, and then we are also part, the library is part of a um, prevention coalition in town that works to address underage substance use. Um, and it's, it's a, a, a strong, it's strong community ties are a protective factor for kids not to do drugs and alcohol. Um, and so a strong library force, if they're attached to the library, um, that's a protective factor for that. Um, some of the outreach um, programs that we were talking about earlier, we are just kicking off with our summer reading program. The theme this year is all together now. Um, we've got a lot of things going on. Um, we've just uh, on the back end of some local interest adult programs. We have some authors, Roy Webb, we've done some great movies. Um, with the book bike, Meg and I are able to go out to farmer's market, we're looking at the county fair. Um, I think it was the support, Family Support Center had a fly and hide event out at OSTA. The best way to know what's going on at the library is our website, moablibrary.org. There's a calendar um, on there that we keep up to date. That's a really great source for what's going on and, and what's happening at the local library. Some other things that we do, if we don't have a book you want or a movie or whatever, let us know. We can get it through interlibrary loan. The cost of that is uh, funded through a grant through the state. We do offer reference assistance. We do it in person over the phone or via email. And we have meeting rooms um, for the public. And that is, an, I'm going to say one thing about the meeting rooms. I know it's. Uh, in 2022, the meeting rooms were used over 1,600 times throughout the year. So far, uh, this year, it's working out to about eight times a day. We have three different meeting rooms. Tutoring is a small room. War room is about 12 people. And then we have the large meeting room. Reason I'm putting so much emphasis on the meeting rooms is I want to talk about some potential challenges that we face at the library. As you may or may not have heard, uh, there's been an increase in the last year or so on um, book bans, material bans across the nation. Um, so far, uh, we're pretty okay. Um, this is not normally a situation that arises with one person that has an issue with one thing at the library, because those I can talk to, we can, you can usually get some grounds, some, some common ground. The huge issue here are national organizations that have an agenda that come into a community, find a local person as a voice, um, and then set out to fulfill their agenda. That is much, much harder to deal with. And knock on wood, this has not happened. Hopefully it won't. I'm just putting it out there. The book bans are something that is happening a lot. Another thing that's happening a lot is public use of meeting rooms. And then um, early 2000s, we saw kind of a trend of this with uh, Nazi organizations that would book public meeting rooms, usually in populations that had, or in areas that had a large Jewish population. And then they would just wait for drama. And that is kind of making a recurrence. They wait for what? Um, yeah, okay. so th there's kind of a reoccurrence, um, not necessarily with with Nazi groups, but with First Amendment, um, drag queen story times, just different types of controversial uses of libraries. Um, Unit County Library is facing one right now, as a matter of fact. And so that is also something that should just be on the radar. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out to County Attorney Stephen Stocks. I sent the policies that the library board has developed to him. He did an amazing review of them, got back to us. We were able to update our policies at the last board meeting, just to kind of make sure we are preemptively preparing if there is some sort of challenge. Um, so I really greatly appreciate that, thank you. Um, one more thing for you, as far as uh, what you can do in regards to the library. Uh, it, it hurts me to say this, but the new library is almost 20 years old. <laughs> and so as the library ages, we're finding that we're having more maintenance issues. Um, and I have an amazing maintenance worker that comes in, works overnight, does a fantastic job cleaning the library, but I'm starting to have to rely heavily on Sean's department. Um, and I would strongly, strongly suggest that, that the commission look at fully funding Sean's department because he is, often stretched thin and um, it's hard to 
I, I hate to feel like I'm taking advantage, but he short staffed and, and could use a group of people for sure. And then nobody wants to talk about it, but services cost money. Um, and the fund balance of the library has been dwindling. And we will be needing to look at either a tax rate increase or some type of alternative funding, most likely this year or next. Um, that's 10 minutes. <laughs> I was told I had 15. I don't know what Renee did it in, but um, <laughs> there, there's some comments just from, from the community. And I will remind the commission that historically, when we've had a library issue go to the voters in the 23 years that I've been at the library, it's about a 75% approval rate. So when you've got 75% of your constituents that agree on something, you're in a good spot. And that's the public library. So um, keep that in mind. And uh, I just want a quick shout out, um, Molly Marcel at the KZMU radio did in a really great story on, she called it Moab's Living Room, and you can stream that through their website. Um, it's the Hello from the Neighborhood section, segment of KZMU. Um, that is all I got. I'm not supposed to say questions. Ah, here's the Castle Valley Library if you haven't been out there. Um, one of the libraries with the best view for sure. Awesome. Thank was, you, Carrie. It was fast and I dumped a lot of information on you. Have any questions? Fast but effective. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and my kids uh, account for an inordinate amount of the materials that get checked out of your library <laughs> every week. <laughs> we love our heavy users. Thank yes. You. All right. Anyone else? Any any questions or comments for? All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you guys. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Gary. Thanks. All right, we have no agency reports today, so we'll move on to approval of minutes. And I would be looking for a motion to approve the minutes from the meeting of uh, May 16th. Make a motion to approve the minutes from the May 16th, 2023 meeting. Thanks, Trish. Second. All right, I have a motion to approve the minutes uh, from Trish and second from Mary. Uh, any discussion on those minutes? And again, I'll give a shout out to Gabe for keeping those rolling in a timely and yeah, absolutely. That's another long one. So thanks, Gabe. Seeing no discussion, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And uh, minutes are approved unanimously. We'll go to ratification of bills and general reports. Um, we'll start with ratification of payment of bills, total bills in the amount of $1,201,179.66. Total payroll in the amount of $371,638.71 for a combined total of $1,572,818.37. So moved. Thanks, Mike. Second. I'll second. All right. I have a motion from uh, Commissioner McCurdy and a second from Commissioner Walker to approve the bills. Any, any discussion of those bills at all? All right. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And the bills are approved unanimously. Uh, commission member disclosures. Any commissioner need to disclose anything concerning today's agenda? All right. We will move on to uh, general commission reports and future considerations. And let's see, I'll uh, start with Trish in the middle of this time. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So I'm going to try to go really fast because there was a lot. Um, on May 22nd, I went to the governor's mansion and had yeah. dinner. That's the first time I've been north, so um, it was time for me to go, and that was a really nice event. On the 24th, I actually went to the EMS um, on a ride-along, luckily. It was really great to see the facility and just to talk with those guys. I luckily did not have to do a ride-along, but it was great just to understand you know, the, how, how much they do for our community and, and such a beautiful facility. Um, I went to the library board meeting on the 24th and Carrie really kind of already went over that. Stephen was there, um, which was great to, to talk about policy. Um, let's see, sorry. On, I went to the planning commission meeting. Oh no, I went to the ADU workshop, but unfortunately I got there really late because I was somewhere else on that same evening, another meeting. Um, and were you there? 
time? I can't. Did you go to the end? I got it. Okay, so I'll let. Okay, you came at the end too, but it was very, very, very well attended. I think there was like 40, 40, people, there. 40 people there, which was awesome. And I, right. I think um, Noel talked about that they would do it again. So it just seemed like a great, they had all these different vendors, all the, you know, you know, building departments from both the city and the county. It just seemed like an excellent, um, excellent event. I went to the film commission meeting that August put together on the 25th. We're going to talk about that later. We met, a number of us met with the sheriff on the 31st and did a quick tour. So that was great. And I think his goal is to meet with the rest of you all at some point. Um, let's see. We, we talked code enforcement a little bit the other day, and we'll be touching on that a little bit more. And then I went to mosquito abatement. This one I think you guys will find interesting because everybody's complaining about yeah. mosquitoes. Itching bites right um, first of all, our new director, I cannot tell you just what a great individual he is. And he is like, not only he's in the office, but he is on the ground working and, and they're working a lot. Um, um, Stephen and Shannon, they're on the ground and hustling. They said they're working approximately about 60 hours a week, both of them. So people are trying and they are getting a lot of citizen concerns. But basically what he said is probably by, by 4th of July-ish, this first influx of mosquitoes should be on the downward trend. Not to say that more won't come about after that, but but that big influx. And the reality is like, you know, with the flooding and you know, all the stagnant water, it was, it's, it's a tough year. And so just kind of keep that in mind. They're out there, they're doing the best they can. It's about, oh, but yeah, we'll talk later as we get into more kind of a gyp die later on in the season and what citizens can do to avoid that. That's it. Thanks, Trish. Yeah. All right, Mary. Wow, <laughs> around. <laughs> Skip around today. Keep keep it keep it interesting. Keep well, you guys on your toes. Well, I want to begin with acknowledging Sophia. I think it's so exciting. The Utah Press Association, she received every in first or second place in every division of the editorial uh, portion for weekly newspapers. That is just amazing. <laughs> She received four first place awards and three second place awards, and I and the edit the editorials that she was judged on were judged by uh, people working in the journalistic realm out of state. Wow! So that avoided them, you know, having friends or knowing or all of this. So it took away all of that possibility of just liking that person so thank you you yes. did a great job so uh then i talked about solid waste we had a solid waste meeting mulch is now ready that they're you know they're selling that and that's a really good deal and it's, it works well covering areas you want the waste to come up they're accepting electronic waste every day that the recycle center is open. So that's nice. So you don't have to hold on to it when you have something electronic and do your best to not throw electronics into the garbage can because they're very toxic and cause issues in, in landfills. Uh, we've stopped for a while. We were uh, pulling electronics when we'd see them. But we did, it's been determined that that's just not healthy for our employees. We're not going to have them digging through the trash to pull out electronics. So it's real important that people take advantage that you can just take your electronics to the recycle center. There's a small fee, but uh, it's reasonable. It's, real, that's a, it's like, reasonable. Yeah, yeah it's reasonable. absolutely. They are, we also uh, voted to enter into a contract with a company called Reftelius uh, to creating a sustainable long-term solid waste financial plan, which uh, it's hard to swallow the cost, <laughs> but I think it's going to be very beneficial because it's a, it's a really incredible. It, I had no idea how important and involved solid waste. It is one of our uh, people who are serving our community 
and I am going to ride in a truck tomorrow to learn how what they do. All right. I was like, okay. Okay. I went to a Four Corners Behavioral Health meeting, and we have something on the agenda later on about what's going on there. Very active board. They have a really good board. So it's kind of nice to sit back and, and just watch such an active board. Uh, Elizabeth Tubbs is the chair, and she does an excellent job. We, the Southeastern Utah Public Health Board, uh, the route to it there, one thing that they're working on is working on uh, equity in health, providing health. And the route to achieving equity will not be accomplished through treating everybody equally. It will be achieved by treating everyone justly according to their circumstances, which is kind of hard to wrap your brain around. But, you know, people are, everybody doesn't need the same type of service or the same approach. Uh, our health equity specialist in Moab had a unique time assisting show, uh, families during COVID. She is a Native American, and with her education and connections and language skills, she assisted over 40 Native American uh, families get connected on basic resources. This work did not stay within this jurisdiction because San Juan County is a part of the Southeastern uh, Utah Health District. They pulled out for some reason quite a few years ago, but we are Moab a Grand County person served people in San Juan County as well and got uh, uh, birth certificates for a lot of the Native American children, which is very important because that such an important thing for you to move forward in many areas in our society. So that's very exciting. Our uh, health department's doing a lot of good work. Uh, they got the statistics out of how things happen, you know, now looking back on COVID and the statistics of how vaccinated people sur uh, survived and had so much better outcome than non-vaccinated people. It's, it's you know, been very able to look back and look at that. And then talking about vaccination rates, it's a real, it's a real concern with how the percentage of uh, people who are vaccinating their children is going down. And that's, I know I grew up with polio. I mean, you know, these are, these diseases we tend to take, they're not that important and all this anti-vaccination, but we did have a measles outbreak, I believe in Emory County. Mm -hmm. So, and we had been without measles for a long, long time. Okay, uh, economic development, we've already talked about, uh, uh, discussed uh, film commission, we're going to, I went to that meeting that we had at the mark, that will be discussed later. Uh, oh, housing task force, nine self-help homes at Aurora Crossing, on track and track E at Aurora Crossing is ready, it's Skyline subdivision, and there's tons of vouchers available for people to help with rent. Uh, the problem is they could get the vouchers but can't find a place to rent. Mm -hmm. But still, if you know somebody that has found a place to rent and is struggling or they're in, already in a rental and they're struggling, you you can use a You can apply for a voucher even if you're already in a rental. Right. So just let people know that those are available and uh, there's quite a few available. They're having an open house at Royal Crossing on the 22nd for some of their new, uh, the, uh, I believe it was the rebuilds. And they received a grant. And then Murphy Flats has an open house on the 17th. And people will be occupied in months. They will be. And I'm going to stop there. So that's what I'm going to do. All right. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Bill. Okay, let's see, start with, um, we met Jock and Mary and I with Cody Stewart, our lobbyist, and lobbyist Jordan Garn. Basically, just a plethora of different things were discussed, but moving forward past 416 and what the future sees and different things. 
That was a good discussion. Let's see. Uh, the first meeting of the Southeastern Water Advisory Council happened. I was nominated to that a while back. So we had our first meeting last week. And then I believe that there's an upcoming to Claiming Gorge Dam that will be in a future meeting. I also was at the governor's mansion with Trish. That was um, very, very educational. We toured both the Capitol building up into the dome and then also the governor's mansion and a lot of history, a lot of history in that one evening that we spent there. So that was really good. Let's see, sat in on the EDD RFP advisory group with August. I think we have one more meeting coming up maybe tomorrow, if I remember. So that's that will be finalized soon. And then I also attended the open house at the Grand Center. I think it's the Bronx, W-R-E-N-3, that they put on over there and then left early and came in at the tail end of the ADU development workshop and spoke briefly at the end of that, just as I've got four or five ADUs under our belt as a construction company. So I spoke for a minute there. Oh, now I sat on the revolving loan fund, the SEU EDD board and the SEU ALG board. They all happened boom, 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 one right after the other. So that's kind of a busy day up in price. Nothing new there. Um, maybe a little bit new, kind of sad. It sounds like Rice Fire Chief has cancer, which is was brought up in that meeting. Certainly a lot of people up there that are close to him a little bit sad. So and it sounds like it's not a, a good diagnosis. So I wanna keep our positive thoughts for him if we can. Um, let's see, I also went to the film holder, the film commission stakeholder meeting. Um, definitely were a lot of citizens there and don't remember somebody gave us the survey results which were quite interesting um i think we all received that mm -hmm. email, yeah. so. i also met with san juan county and some of that will come up later it's regarding the land that we own out in san juan county is what that meeting was about and then i attended the edad meeting just as a observant rather than the liaison there to just see what was going on and then i've been involved with tammy from the airport and the red gel aviation thing clearly has a lot of us excited to hope that maybe there's still some form of air service that will happen in the future to salt lake and to see if that will possibly expand for them and then as far as the ongoing issue with Sky West, why I know that um, I've had conversations with staff in the last two weeks of Romney staff, Mike Lees and John Curtis, and they all are continuing to kind of put pressure on, but nothing has moved whatsoever to get the Sky West charter approved. So we're still at the same place and we'll be signing up with Contour soon, I believe. I don't know that exact rate. Yeah. Our airport board meeting is actually postponed. It would have been yesterday normally, but it's next week. So I'm all no more after that. Right. That's it. All right. Been busy three weeks for everybody. <laughs> um, Mike. Mine's a little shorter. Still running shallow on committees here. Uh, OSA just had a uh, successful rodeo. Uh, Sweet. Quite a turnout. And, um, Quite a good show. Uh, look, host is again looking forward to Grand County Fair, uh, both the promotion uh, and just turnout uh, events. Um, there is going to be a during uh, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th uh, Grand County Fair, uh, there will be a car show, a tractor show, volleyball tournament, softball tournament. I, I, there, there's a huge list of activities, and they want to they wanted us to uh, continue to support that. Yeah. Um, on a personal note, uh, seeing uh, questions in our emails, uh, the second testing for the uh, cell tower has gone through and is looking optimistic in San Juan County on private land. 
So that cell tower will be falling through here soon, uh, which I mean helps us out in the southern end of the valley. Um, had a meeting, uh, a short uh, lunch meeting with uh, Lieutenant Governor while you guys were up uh, up north. Lieutenant Governor stopped in Moab, had a couple of us over there. Uh, that was uh, good to uh, good to make that relationship and good to get some of our points. Uh, our our, uh, our points are not. Uh, just ours alone. Uh, there are larger problems across uh, Utah, and uh, I mean, housing being number one. Uh, it, we're not alone in that fight, so that was good to hear. Um, there is a future, it's not so much a future uh, consideration, but a request. Uh, I had a couple members of uh, our constituents reach out and have questions on the OPMA fact or OPMA. Uh, public meetings. Uh, we had four commissioners at a meeting and uh, they had uh, expressed concern. So keep an eye on that. Uh, but other than that, just be easy going. All right. What's it a meeting called by somebody else? It was a film commission. Okay. So it was called by somebody else. Yeah. They said we had too many, uh, too many commissioners in, in one area uh, during a, a decision meeting. They give us the work. What workshop stakeholder, stakeholder mm -hmm. workshop yeah. and, I, and, and i checked into that i called the grand bidders and in those situations where there's not an agenda and the mission is not uh discussing or uh you know gathering and putting things together that that's okay it's called a uh because i know i didn't know who was going to be there so that's a uh what how do they say it uh social um, when somebody I, x x you know so because i called the grand bidders about a couple of the times that like when we were doing those uh testing on oh ohbs and such and that uh, more than one commissioner would want to go and see it and so that it's it, it was more it was more liberal than i anticipated when i talked to the grant bidder i'm not yeah, directly sure about that it was it was a question raised to me yeah okay there was bail we yeah i think it's i think it, we, there have been situations like that but we can sure i'm sure the governor's dinner had many quorums <laughs> yes a lot right. of quorums there. yes there were a lot of quorums not from this body nope. no no all right. So that, that's the only spot that we're discussing here. And I take the I, point very seriously what Mike's saying, and we should as well, that that this is an important thing when we're in the public eye and people are watching us. It's it's um, perception again, whether or not it's legal or not. I I defer to Stephen's opinion on that, but I, I think it's important we realize that people do see those things going on and bring it up and they they didn't to me, but the fact they did to Mike is important. And it, it, only in the saying that too is I would really like to have been a sheriff one too. I mean, yep, first go right. to right. but we, we watch that line the best we can. Yeah. There was an opening at that. I know. At that. I, I, I got so it. I'm that, just saying. I got it that morning. <laughs> but, but, I, but I think well, it's, I, I know. for me either, but I mean, I mean, I filled in that slot. So, Mike, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the sheriff meeting because I, I think there is an important distinction of that sheriff tour there was discussion about policy issues yeah, yeah. and and so we I, I think the feeling was yeah we shouldn't have a quorum doing that whereas if you're just attending an event and listening that that's a very different thing and and so i i think i, I think we have been in compliance with both the letter and the spirit of, of Oman. um and it's but it's not just like this simple rule of you know four commissioners in one place can't happen Unless it's a meeting, it's, it's it's a little more complicated than that, but I, th I think it makes sense, and I think we're fully in compliance. And, and I think that that sheriff floor is a good a good example. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Mike. We'll move on to uh, Evan. Uh, I met with the Boundary Commission a couple of times regarding uh, annexation into the city. Um, there were concerns by some citizens around uh, the city continuing to cherry stem their boundaries. Um, it was found that uh, there was no standing. I don't know all the legal terms, but that they're, they're, they didn't have the ability to dispute it, basically. Um, I also was at the hazard mitigation meeting. It was very well attended. I was very uh, glad to see that and CORE's efforts around making that happen. 
Um, I also attended the Lieutenant Governor's lunch. It was pretty informal. There were uh, a little bit of chats around um, strategies with the mill site and moving forward and, and kind of transitioning yeah. that um, without going through the whole rigmarole of uh, every federal agency in line before us. And then, as mentioned, I was one of the four at the Film Commission uh, roundtable that um, kind of saved the summary for the later agenda item. Great. Thanks, like Kevin. Uh, Kevin. Um, I, I think a lot of the meetings that I was at have either already been mentioned or are on agenda items. So I'm just going to focus on one, which is another part of this. Um, I don't know how we pronounce the acronym, but the WURUMP or RUMP or whatever. <laughs> Around the water group, um, they um, on on June second there was another. I think they called it a focus group, um, but that was just restricted to elected officials. But but I thought it'd be a good chance just to re remind folks about you know what's going on there. Um, there there's going to be you know multiple phases to this, but the phase they're working on currently is more. Um, it's more an engineering plan, not a policy plan. It's just trying to understand. Like, what would it, you know, if we had to start using Mill Creek surface water, you know, what does that cost? We're, you know, that that kind of thing. Um, similar questions for Colorado River water. Um, and just tr trying to get the the, the facts, facts down. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think initially in the process, there was an emphasis on water providers, and Grand County is not a water provider. You know, we don't have to worry about, you know, engineering, things like that. Um, but as, as it moves on, there's a, it's, it's, it's going to be exploring implications for planning. And of course, we are in the middle of doing land use planning. And, and so I think something that will come up right throughout this year is just, you know, how, how we want to take into account water considerations when doing long range planning for um, Spanish Valley. I was kind of impressed that the, the thing they're working on now is trying to look 100 years in the future. That's, that's pretty far. Um, so anyway, mostly just um, just a heads up that we'll continue to be um, discussing water issues. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I attended a, a museum board meeting where uh, we welcomed a new board member, actually a new old board member, Tani Newton, was elected as a full board member. She'd previously been the city liaison to the museum and she does a great job in that capacity so that's a uh, that's good news for the museum they had a gala recap they recently had their uh their fundraising gala which i was unable to attend but was apparently a great success everyone had a good time and and, and it was a fundraising success as well um there was a review of programs the museum keeps kicking out just great great programs and great programming they had they had temple grandin recently they had the um they had the um the horses down on the lawn uh and, and a few other things but but just kudos to the, to the museum for for just continuing to to bring very cool programming to southeast utah to our small community um and then i helped in, in line with all that they they a couple of years ago they purchased a um a unit at the Moat business park to help house all their collections in a, in a more um just a kind of museum compliant way keeping everything uh clean and and so there wouldn't be any cross contamination and whatnot so we helped with an effort they had three storage units kind of scattered around with with just piles of dusty whole boxes and whatnot in it so so we did a a big moving day into the uh into the new facility and involved a lot of cleaning and whatnot um so they're they're continuing to to improve over there uh so congrats to forrest and everyone at the museum for that uh, I attended a historic preservation committee meeting. Um, the big thing that came out of that is they voted to allow for a majority quorum with a view towards adding to their, it's, it's currently a seven member, uh, commission and they'd like to increase it to maybe nine or even, even 11 in the future. So they just wanted to, to amend the rules to enable that. So, so in other words, if there are nine people it would be a five, five person quorum, et cetera. Um, 
And they also, we also discussed a historic sites tour that's been in the works for quite a while with the Historic Preservation Committee. Um, also, a few of the other meetings that everyone else spoke of, I, I attended the lunch with the Lieutenant Governor. Um, I attended the Hazard Mitigation Workshop that Evan attended as well. And, and kudos to Cora for putting that on and continuing to just do a great job in the role of emergency manager. And it's that's that's why we've needed one, been a good one for so long. Cora is very much up to the task and, and keeping everything rolling and keeping us uh, FEMA compliant, which is very important for, for hazard funding and, and relief and, and everything else. Uh, Sheriff's tour also I participated in. Um, and uh, and that's about it. So yeah, relatively busy. <laughs> Three weeks. And all right, so that takes care of our commission reports. We'll move on to elected official reports. And we have uh, Chris Kaufman here with the Treasurer's Report on 2022 collections and investments. And Chris, or yeah, Chris is gonna join us from Zoom. Hi, Chris. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Great, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Hopefully that's working. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Chris Kaufman, Grand County Treasurer. I'm here to report on the 2022 collections, investments, and other updates from my office. Um, I'll start right in on the 2022 collections. I report on this every year uh, to the commission to keep you up to date on how it's going with property tax collections. And the first thing we'll talk about is the 2022 collection rate. The collection rate is simply the amount of tax that we bring in versus the total amount of taxes that were charged. And the reason that we keep an eye on this statistic is because it is used by the state in the uh, calculation of the property tax rate. And the reason they do that is the state is basically saying, look, we know that you're not gonna bring in all of the taxes that you asked for. And so we're gonna let you uh, ask for a little bit more to take into account what you're not going to collect in, that, uh, in the current year. And so what that means is that the higher your collection rate, the lower your tax rate. And so we keep an eye on this because it helps us to uh, reduce the amount of property taxes that we have to ask for from the taxpayers. And in 2022, we did see a slight decrease in the uh, collection rate uh, from 21 to 22. However, 2021 was the highest collection rate we've achieved so far, and 2022 was our third highest. So still a very uh, good year uh, on property tax collections. Uh, the graph that I'm showing on the screen shows everything from 86 uh, through 22, and you can see that we do have a trend of increasing, and especially over the last uh, about eight years or so, we've been able to get uh, much higher collection rates. However, it's not the individual collection rate from one year that the state uses in its um, calculation they use a five-year collection rate. Um, and that helps to even out uh, the volatility that you may see from one year to the next. And this graph shows the collection rate over five years, or the five-year average. And uh, you can see that we have a steadily increasing five-year average as well. And so what does it mean in actual real terms that these rates are going up? Well, the increase in the five-year collection rate from 21 to 22, is gonna result in us asking for about $44,000 less in property tax than we otherwise would have. But when you look at it over a longer period of time, let's say our uh, collection rate had stayed at the 2014 level and had not, in, not increased over the last eight years, that would have resulted in 3.3 million additional tax dollars being uh, charged during that eight year period. So it does make a big difference, um, and especially over time, it makes a big difference. And so it's something that I really focus on in my, in my office to do everything we can to improve that collection rate, um, get it even higher, or at least keep it up at this level that we're starting to maybe plateau out um, near. And to put that into some more perspective, 
we can look at uh, where Grand County stands in relation to other counties. Um, and in 2023, our collection rate was the ninth highest in the state. It is important to note that you know every county has its own uh, circumstances. I think um, you know the number of properties that you have that have a mortgage or that have sold recently, those are more likely to have the taxes paid than a property that's been paid off for years. Um, the economic situation in any given county is different. So it's it, in some ways it's hard to compare counties, but if we look over time in 2014, uh, Grand County was the 18th highest. So we are definitely improving our collection rate um, faster than uh, in relation to other counties. And this graph shows the change in the five-year average over the, from 2015 to 2023. And Grand County had the fourth highest change, uh, and, and which was an increase um, over that time period. Any questions about the collection rate? Yeah. All right. Looks like I'm sorry, what was that? No. Looking good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. All right, uh, moving on then to the redemption collection rate and uh, redemptions, delinquencies, back taxes, those are all the same thing. Uh, those are just taxes that weren't paid in the current year that get paid in subsequent years. We also keep an eye on how we're doing in collecting those back taxes. And one of the reasons that we keep an eye on that is because the fewer back taxes we have, the better our collection rate. It's hard to pay your current year taxes when you have a whole bunch of back tax years to pay as well. So we have found that helping people to catch up on their back taxes has really improved our collection rate. And again, that leads to um, saving uh, taxpayers dollars and not having to charge as much taxes. So the redemption collection rate was 63% roughly in 2022, which is a pretty strong collection rate. Um, this graph on the left shows the back tax collection rate uh, from 2010 to 2022. You can see that 22 was our fourth highest collection rate. Um, it did drop from 21, but still a pretty good rate. And the graph on the right shows the amount of back tax collected. And um, this is interesting because in 21, we had our highest amount of back taxes collected ever. There were some specific reasons for that, primarily the Union Pacific settlement coming in and then paying a huge chunk of that. Um, but you can see we didn't collect a whole lot of money in 22, even though we got a pretty high collection rate. And that's because there were so few back taxes actually owed at the beginning of the year. And this graph helps to demonstrate that. The one on the left shows that the amount of back taxes due on January 1st for each year and you can see that in 2022, it was a historically low amount of back tax that was owed at the beginning of the year. And therefore, there was no way we were going to collect a huge amount because it wasn't out there to collect, which is a really good thing. Uh, it, it's really good that our taxpayers are so caught up um, and have so few back taxes. And to put these numbers in, I think, even better perspective, the graph on the right uh, shows the amount of back tax due at the beginning of the year as a percentage of the total taxes charged over five years. Because, you know, the total amount of taxes charged in 2009 was a lot lower than today due to inflation and other things. And you can see that in 22 and 23, we just have an extremely low percentage of uh, taxes that have not been paid when you look back over five years. And we look back over five years because that's the redemption period. Um, very few parcels are going to have taxes that are over five years uh, late because at five years uh, is when the tax sale gets triggered. And uh, speaking of tax sales, another indication of the low amount of back tax we have uh, outstanding is that earlier this year in, in uh, March, we only had two parcels that were eligible for tax sale. And uh, we will discuss those two parcels a little bit later on the agenda. But when I first started as treasurer, I had about 50 parcels um, at that time of year that were eligible for tax sales. So it's just good news all around when those back taxes are getting paid on time. Any questions about the redemption collections? 
Okay, another aspect that has been helping us with um, our collection rate and also with just efficiency in our office is electronic payments. And I show you this grass graph every year and every year it just seems to go up by about a million um, dollars that we've been collecting electronically. Taxpayers uh, are finding the convenience uh, of paying electronically and preferring that. And I think that's happening across our society. So it's not surprising to see it happen, happening in um, property tax payments as well. Um, so the, the, the raw dollar amount has been increasing, but also the raw number of just payments has been going up quite a bit. And this is really important for my office because the, every time someone pays online, uh, we get to download their payment directly into our accounting software. We don't have to open an envelope. We don't have to deposit a check. We don't have to manually enter any of that information. So it's just making things a lot more um, efficient in our property tax collections. And it's a trend that we hope to see continue. And we are doing everything that we can to encourage people to make electronic payments, make it as convenient and cheap as possible for, for folks. And uh, hopefully we can continue with that. Um, another aspect of <clears throat> improving the collection rate is with uh, the auto bill pay program that we have. And auto bill pay is uh, just like it sounds like, you know, the same thing that you might have for your credit card. Uh, or your utility bill, it uh, pays your property taxes directly out of your um, account. Uh, it And we have it set up so that it knows exactly how much property tax you owe. And it uh, renews every year until the taxpayer asks it to stop. So for those who choose it, it's extremely convenient. You set it up once, you never have to think about it again. Um, you do have to keep enough money in your bank account to pay the taxes, but you do also get emails reminding you um, every time a payment comes out. And we did see an increase in the number of people on auto bill pay. Uh, in 2021, we had about 313, we went up to 382. And again, we are doing our best to uh, make this option available to folks who wanna use it. Next, we can move on to the investments for 2022. Um, it's kind of a fun year to report on this because uh, for the first time in a, in a little while, we have some good news on interest rates. Um, the uh, graph that I have up here shows the PTIF interest rates uh, historically and up to the present. Um, PTIF stands for Public Treasurer's Investment Fund. It's where the county and most public entities in Utah have the majority of their money invested. And this graph shows that we were above 5% before the Great Recession, which then we had a crash in interest rates. They stayed low for a long time. They were just starting to come up and then COVID hit and they dropped back down. And now we have the Fed, the Federal Reserve fighting inflation and we have um, other factors that are leading the interest rates to go up very quickly. And so in 2022, we did see uh, quite an increase in the amount of interest that the county earned through its PTIF accounts. Uh, the graph on the left shows total interest earnings in PTIF from 2015 through 2022. 2023 is a projection. Um, and you can see that 2022 was quite a bit higher than the previous years. And uh, 2023 is gonna be a banner year for um, investment earnings. Uh, we have already gotten through half of the year with the high interest rates remaining and continuing to climb a bit. Um, you know, nobody knows when the Fed is going to start to back off, but that depends on inflation and how the economy is doing. And I think the signs right now are pointing to those interest rates staying high, at least through the end of the year. It's not just the interest rates that have increased our interest earnings. It's also the balances that we hold in those accounts. And uh, the graph on the right shows the uh, total amount that we have invested in PTIF. Um, and here you can see there's a pretty steady increase with 2022 having the most at the end of the year that we have ever had. Uh, I do wanna make it clear that not all of that money is you know, available to the county to use. This is, um, includes all of our PTIF accounts, um, including bonds and other money that we're holding on to folks. So for folks. We also have an investment with uh, Zions Capital Advisors, 
And this is another good news story. Uh, with interest rates increasing, we were able to um, go from about $10,000 earned in 2021 to about $55,000 in 22. Uh, we also invested an additional million dollars in this fund. <clears throat> this fund is sort of a hedge against the PTIF because it's invested in bonds that are uh, usually uh, a little bit longer out. So uh, they're going to be more, we have more of the two to three year bonds uh, with our ZCA investment. And what that does is it um, makes it so that it's a little bit less volatile. So PTIF tends to go up and down pretty uh tightly with the current interest rate, whereas this investment is going to um, not be as volatile. So when you're in a steady or declining interest rate environment, this one is going to beat PTIF quite a bit. Um, and the last time I looked, this investment had earned roughly uh, about fifteen dollars to $30,000 more than if we had kept it just in PTIF. Now, in the interest rate environment we're in right now, where it's climbing really steadily, PTIF is going to beat this one for a while, but it will eventually catch up. And the reason we invested an additional million dollars was because that got us to a, a better return versus fees. Um, they have a minimum fee that they charge, and then when or a percentage, whichever is higher. And so with three million, roughly three million invested, we are now at the point where we're paying that percentage as opposed to the minimum fee. So we're getting a better ratio there. Um, the last investment update is that uh, we were able to open a sweep account. I'm sorry, was there a question? No. Oh, okay. Um, we were able to open a sweep account in, late last year. And the sweep account is, is associated with our checking account. Uh, we try to keep as much money invested in PTIF as possible all the time, but we have to keep a certain amount of money in our checking account to cover outstanding checks and um, any other expenses. And the sweep account is great because on a daily basis, it takes everything you have in your checking account and invests it, and it automatically covers any payments you've got coming out of that account. Um, in the past, the sweep account uh, was not very attractive because the monthly fee just to have the account uh, was was potentially higher than the interest you were gonna earn when interest rates were so low. With interest rates higher, it is now uh, a no brainer to have one of these. So in 2023, um, this number is probably out of date now, we're gonna earn at least 30,000, probably more than that, um, just on the money that we're keeping in our checking account. Any questions on investments? All right, I've just got a few other updates. Uh, we do offer an email notice service uh, for taxpayers. They can sign up to have their tax bills sent to them by email instead of through the postal mail. And in 2022, we switched vendors uh, for this service. And I think it was a big improvement. Um, it's a better website. It's a better service. Um, we went from 224 uh, people enrolled or parcels enrolled, I should say, to 367 parcels enrolled in 2022. Um, I also worked with the clerk auditor's office, and um, now when you sign up for either the valuation or tax bill, you get the other one by email as well. So that's another big advantage to our new providers that they're able to do the valuation notice and the tax bill with one sign up and one login. And email notices, they do save the county some money. We don't have to, to uh, print the bill and uh, do the postage. But it's also more convenient for taxpayers who like that um, format. They don't have to be at home to get their tax bill. They don't have to check the mail. They get it a few days earlier than everybody else. And they can also send that bill to multiple addresses if they want their spouse or their accountant or somebody else to get that bill as well. Um, I did want to address the bank collapses that happened earlier this year. Um, and I did want to assure everybody that Grand County's investments were not greatly impacted by those issues in any way. Most of our investments are in bonds that pay out interest, and we are almost always holding those bonds to maturity. And therefore, even if the market value of those bonds were to go down, uh, we would still get, we would just hold on to those bonds and get the interest and they would pay out. Uh, clearly, you know, if there was a financial crisis where, you know, defaults started to happen on bonds, uh, that would be a much more concerning situation. 
And uh, we are limited, um, you know, by state statute and by good sense to only invest in bonds that are, um, I believe, triple A rated. Maybe we can go to triple B plus plus or something like that. But uh, we're only invested in the highest rated bonds. Um, Another update from last year is that uh, working with the closely with the clerk auditor's office, uh, we were able to make huge headway on clearing up stale uncashed checks off the county's books. So these are checks that the county wrote uh, over many years, but were never cashed. And these checks were still on our books, even though state statute requires that after about a year, if uh, the check has not been cashed, that you either um, reissue the check to the citizen, or you send it to the state where they have a website, which you've probably seen advertised, um, where you can go and look for money that's owed to you that's been given to the state. Um, but we were able to contact the state office uh, and sign a contract with them, allowing us to uh, come into compliance with them, avoid any fees or penalties, and to get those um, stale uncashed checks cleared up. And so in that process, thousands of dollars were reissued out to citizens and a fairly small amount was sent up to the state. And going forward, we'll be clearing those out on a yearly basis. And then lastly, uh, we are in the process right now of signing up for a service through our bank called Positive Pay. It's something that a lot of counties and other uh, government agencies use and even businesses as well. And it's a check fraud prevention service Every time that we, once we're signed up, whenever we have a check run, we will send a file to our bank with all the data from that check run. Whenever a cash is, uh, check is presented to be cashed, if it doesn't match the data in the file, then the county will be alerted and we can make sure that it's not a fraudulent check. So we are always looking for ways to um, make the county safer, to protect our money and our investments and prevent fraud. And this, I think, is another uh, good one that we can add to our list there. Um, before I uh, end, I think one other thing to mention about the collection rate is that uh, we have been uh, doing some things, especially at the end of the year, that are really, I think, making a big difference on the collection rate. Um, taxes are due November 30th, um, so they technically become delinquent on December 1st, but we still, any taxes that we collect in December still accrue to the collection rate for that year. So we get that one month to try and get people to really pay uh, when we know that they haven't, and that can really boost the collection rate. So we've been sending out a postcard to every delinquent taxpayer as soon as possible in December, um, encouraging them to get it paid before the end of the year. We also make a list of all the taxpayers um, with delinquencies. We order that list by the people who owe the most, and we reach out to them in any way we can, email, phone call, um, any way that we can, just to let them know. And most people are just happy to find out uh, in many cases, it's just an oversight. And uh, just by contacting them, they are able to get that payment in before the end of the year and to help our collection rate. Thank you for your time. Did, were there any other questions? Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Kevin? Um, yeah, I was gonna say thank you also. And I particularly appreciate um, not, you know, not just the historical things are Grand County collection rates, but also the comparison with other counties, which you know helps understand what you know what counts as a good number and what doesn't. So thanks. Excellent. Thank you very job. much. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, great job. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. All right. Looks like we have uh, Sheriff Wiggins on. Um, did you want to do a uh, elected report today, uh, Sheriff? Yeah, if I can. Please. So for the month of May, we had 3,500 calls into our dispatch. We had 1,200 911 emergency calls. Um, the deputies responded to 1,122 calls. We did 330, um, 343 traffic stops. We arrested 21 people. We served 38 papers and our search and rescue calls jumped to 24. Um, there was a search and rescue conference at Fish Lake, and our SAR sergeant attended that. Um, I have some exciting news that the sheriff's office is 
officially fully staffed in every department for the first time in 20 plus years. Um, I'm not ex exactly sure on the numbers, but what I've been told is 20 plus. We're still waiting on some vehicles. Um, we have no spare vehicles. Um, in the month of May, we awarded a life-saving award to River Berry for a search and rescue incident in uh, November of last year. Our major crimes task force has been very uh, effective in working on drug-related crimes and internet crimes against children. We're up to 532 pounds of meth for the year, 83 pounds of cocaine, and 23 pounds of fentanyl. We received our grant from the state of Utah in the amount of $10,000 that went towards our body cameras. The body, our new body cameras are in. Uh, we're waiting on Motorola to come to the sheriff's office and, and turn them on. They'll be effective June 20th. So we're excited about having new body cameras. Um, and then we were just recently awarded an, a grant from the DNR in the amount of $44,323 for the Sheriff's Office OHV Education and SAR Assistance Summary Project. It's an 80-20% split on that. And the goal behind this grant is to get deputies in the backcountry on side-by-sides and um, have more of a presence. And also, it'll be nice to have side-by-sides where the deputies can just hop into them um, and go and assist search and rescue because there's a lot of times that our patrol vehicles can't make it into the locations that um, where we're having a search and rescue. So it'll be nice to have some side-by-sides uh, to help. And then we also, we had a, a tour of the sheriff's office with some of the commissioners. And if any of the commissioners that didn't attend want to attend, let me know and we'll uh, take you on another tour. And that's all I've got. All right. Thank you so much, Jamison. Appreciate it. Thank Good you. Job. You bet. All right. Um, Clerk Wojtek, do you have a report today? None today. Thank you. And Attorney Stocks. Um, yeah, I've had the opportunity. Um, last meeting that we had, I was up at the CJC uh, training in Snowbird. That went great. Um, we also received the county attorney's office two notices that uh, two of the attorneys would be moving on. Um, we wish them the best of luck. We are conducting interviews. The job is posted for not only one, but two positions at the county attorney's office. Additionally, um, I was able to go to a couple different meetings. I hosted an OPMA training um, that we had attendance. It could have been done in this room, but uh, there are people that came uh, next year. We would hope that more would come. I'd like to thank Mallory and Quinn and Alicia for printing out certificates. Um, they were very monumental in helping facilitate that, as well as Sean and Vesta helping uh, post that in the Star Hall. That was great. Otherwise, we're continuing on. Uh, we've got busy, busy workload and only one attorney. So it's uh, trudging onward. Um, I don't believe we have any new applicants. So we'll keep our fingers crossed and on we go. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. Uh, administrator reports, Mallory? Um, I would say, uh, um... A lot of what you guys spoke to, I attended or watched online, <laughs> so I won't add more today, but hopefully a lot of exciting stuff at the next meeting. All right. And Quinn, anything to add? Good. All right. All right. So it's uh, close to 530, and we are on to our general business and action items. Um, and we'll start out uh, at the top of our agenda with number one, Four Corners Community Behavioral Health. Uh, incorporated fiscal year 2024 to 2026 area plan. And I'd welcome Melissa Huffington, Executive Director of the Four Corners Community Behavioral Health. Oh, hello. Sorry, forgot to unmute. <laughs> um, thank you for having me today. Uh, every year, we are statutorily um, required to come to each of the counties that we serve. Um, Sorry, let me back up. I'm Melissa Huntington. I'm the executive director of Four Corners Community Behavioral Health. I've been in this role for about two years now. Um, sorry, I'm just all, all business, just right down to business. Um, <laughs> so we have an area plan and essentially the area plan that we present is um, just indicating what services that we are proposing that we'll be planning to provide for each of the communities for the upcoming year. Generally, that's how it works. This year, the de 
the Office of Substance Abuse and Mental Health um, has opted to move to a three-year plan. So after this one gets approved today, um, we will get reapproval three years from now. Um, that's really helpful because it won't be a static document. We will make it a living document. We'll, we'll, we'll continue to add throughout those three years to it. Um, but it, it does help us a little bit with some of the overwhelming um, paperwork and things that we have required by us. So a um, couple of things just to kind of note in the area plan, the only significant changes were around the receiving center, which I think we talked last year to you about also. Um, we were hoping to have our crisis receiving center up by now, but <clears throat> some of the uh, weather had different ideas for us and we weren't able to finish remodeling the building we were going to move our existing staff into. So that's kind of been a little bit of a challenge, but we are hoping by fall, we will have our crisis receiving center open. And just as a quick kind of overview for those who don't know, Crisis Receiving Center is a 24-hour facility that allows anybody to walk in and um, receive and start to receive services. If they can't be most appropriately helped there, um, then we will find a place for them to go. The most exciting thing about this is it will support law enforcement tremendously in their efforts to try and get back on the road. And um, I know working with individuals with mental illness or um, substance intoxication can sometimes be challenging and take a long time. And so this is a way of um, minimizing that. Uh, the receiving center will be housed in Carbon County, but we obviously have the availability to take any citizen from any county. And um, it can be walk-in, you can have family members drop them off, um, you can have community partners bring them into the facility. Um, and then once, so it's a 23 hour, up to a 23 hour unit. Once that time expires, you um, either move them into a lower restrictive setting. So you return them home or something less intense. Um, you set up a safety plan or you, you uh, send them to a higher restrictive setting. So you maybe put them in the hospital or something like that. So um, you do place them somewhere. You don't just like discharge them on the streets <laughs> after they get out after 23 hours. So um, yeah. So when we do our grand opening, I'd love to have Grand County as much as possible participate and come into our facility because absolutely we've been talking to um, the sheriff um, last year when we were first starting to open it about coming and talking about how he can get citizens there. So um, that's the main change to our area plan. Other than that, we just are continuing to provide um, quality outpatient services and um, be able to get, get folks where they need to be. So yeah, that's kind of our plan. Do you guys have any questions for me? Thank you, Melissa. Um, and we appreciate the services that you provide. You. Are there any questions for Melissa this time? Uh, yes, please, Gabe. Hey, Melissa, is Clark Otter of White Tech. Remember, I was on your board. Oh, I, oh yes, Hi, I then. remember you. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to ask real quick how you how Four Corners feels like the new facility here in Moab is uh, suiting your services. Oh, it's so great. Um, I'm sure many of you had seen, at least driven by our old facility, which was sort of just like a converted house. <laughs> and and our um, facility where we housed our clubhouse, um, which was sort of like a trailer. So we have expanded greatly, both in services and employees over the past several years. So this was a much needed resource. Besides the fact that the building is accommodating our needs for our clients and our staff, we've also been able to provide um, several community like events at our property which has been nice because it's such a central location and it's a pretty big piece of land. And so we've been able to have the community over to, for different events that we've hosted and barbecues and things. So it's lovely. We're so excited. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions or comments for Melissa or anyone care to um, 
Make a motion, Mary. I move for the, I move for the signing of the fiscal year 2024 to 2026 area plan for Four Corners Community Behavioral Health Incorporated and authorize all commission members to sign all associated documents. Thank you. All right, I have a motion on the table from Commissioner McGinn and a second from Commissioner Winfield. Any further discussions on, on this item? Yeah, let me sign those tonight. We do, I have the uh, list right here and I will circulate it after that has been uh, ratified. All right, I'll call for a vote on the motion. All those in favor, raise your hands. And that passes unanimously. So thanks, thanks again, Melissa. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys very much. All right. We're on to agenda item number two, approving property tax deferrals and back to uh, Treasurer Kaufman. Thank you. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, uh, we only had two parcels this year that were still eligible for tax sale back in the spring. And um, these, both of these parcels have applied for a deferral. And um, many counties, including Grand County, have traditionally allowed <clears throat> a deferral for uh, about six months uh, for anyone who it is, it's their parcel's first year up for tax sale. Um, we do this because, you know, sometimes people just need a little bit more time to get it paid up. It's definitely not in the taxpayer's interest or the county's interest to auction off their properties. And um, it's also just in the best interest for everybody uh, to avoid that when we can. And to be clear, um, if, the, if either of these parcels is not uh, paid up by next year this time, we would not be asking for this type of deferral again. Um, and they would either have to pay or um, have their property potentially go up for tax sale. Um, the total uh, <clears throat> impact this year is about $51,000 in delinquent property taxes. Uh, it's important to note that that amount would be spread across all taxing entities. Um, and we will eventually get this money um, and it is earning interest or it's accumulating interest um, during the time that it's deferred. Um, and let's see. It's the commission that has the um, ability to uh, grant these type of deferrals. And so I bring them to you every year. And are there any questions? Questions for Chris? Do we need to identify the parcels? They are identified in the agenda item. It is yeah, parcel. The, the motion says, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Should it be in our motion? It hasn't been in the past. Um, this says as presented in the in the recommended motion. Okay. It's probably. Okay. I move to approve the property tax deferrals as presented. Thanks, Mary. All right, I have a motion from Commissioner McGann to approve and a second from Commissioner McCurdy. Uh, any further discussion on the deferrals? All right, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And that passes unanimously. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you. All right, we're on to uh, agenda item number three, Moab to Monument Valley Film Commission, Red Close Foundation, Scope of Work. Uh, looks like, Mallory, you're presenting this one. Uh, by presenting, I simply am introducing this uh, item. I think you all received a link to the video from the stakeholder meeting, um, as well as the survey results that were referenced earlier. And so say the objective putting this on as an action item is not actually a contract at this point, but the scope of work would be the content of the contract along with some of the other um, terms that you would need to sort out, which would be the length of time for an initial contract as well as the contribution. So you are not approving an agreement, but you would be approving content and instructing staff to put that into a contract that could be sorted out with Red Cliffs and brought back to you uh, at the next meeting for formal approval of the contract. Uh, that being said, I 
I can just turn it over to you guys. Um, I don't know if you want to sure. hear from anybody or just get started with the discussion. Yeah, I think starting with the discussion would be appropriate. And I know we did have a number of commissioners who did attend that discussion. Um, so maybe I would uh, ask one of them to, to start things off for us, if, if, if one of you don't mind. Well, you guys did have access to the video to watch the discussion. Um, I would state that the feedback that I've gotten both independently for quite some time, I mean, I would say that the independent feedback I've gotten is goes far back um, and then from the meeting and then after the meeting was people do not want to see privatization of the film commission. You know, at least that's the general consensus that I can state from the feedback that I've received. I think it is pushing, if you think about the Film Commission, the goal is to assist productions that are coming to town to find scouts, to find hotels, to find food, et cetera, and so on. So simply a funnel to bring productions in and disperse those jobs and resources out to the community. I think when you are, are located at one entity that has a hotel, that has food, it is inevitable that a lot of those jobs and or resources are going to stay at that entity. And so I don't I don't think it's appropriate. I you know I, I just don't think it's appropriate. Um, one of the things that I'll state from that meeting is Mac from San Juan County stood up and made quite a hubbub about how it should be a collaborative effort and yet I don't see San Juan County coming to the table and helping us pay for the film commission. If they want to, that's great. We, I'm sure we would happily take their funding, but I haven't seen that. I don't know of that. I don't know if there's been a history of that. And so to me, collaboration is, you know, entities coming together and helping to pay for, in this case, a film commissioner. So I am not at all in favor of moving this out to Red Cliffs. I'll just state that. And, and from the feedback that I've received, this wasn't a personal opinion or vendetta. It's it's all of the feedback that I'm receiving, you know, from people that have worked in that industry a very, very, very long time. So, Bill? I don't believe it's privatization going into a nonprofit for one. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who have concerns about it going to an entity. Yes, I, I get the same feedback that she's had from a lot of them and have gone out of my way to talk to them. There's also a lot of people that are willing to look at it on a trial basis. They're, they would like to see that contract based around that way. And I was also there and I, I don't think what Max said was a hubbub at all. I believe he made some very valid points about wanting to collaborate and be a part of the process. And for San Juan County to be involved in that, then they want the freedom to be able to be a part of this and to receive a benefit from it so that they have participated at a very small level in the past. and. I think to move forward and see participation from them in the future, that it's going to have to be based around um, some sort of equalization rather than controlled by Grand County. So I see both sides of it. If we are not going to allow it to go to a nonprofit at the Red Cliff, then we need to get real serious about what we are going to allow it to do because it isn't working where it's at and we've got to change that. And this isn't an HR issue. This this is not an HR issue whatsoever. This is Grand County. I mean, the city of Moab had it for a while, then I believe we shared it jointly. Moab gave up on it and we brought it over here and we haven't done a real good job of either funding it or paying a salary that's comparable to other department heads in this building right here. And, and we've got to look at the fact that maybe we're, we are the problem. Grand County is part of the problem here and that we've got to figure out what's best. Is it 
Redcliffe. I'm not saying that it is or isn't, but I support something different. I would also say from uh, from the meeting, there was a, a large consensus in the room that being housed within the county was not uh, under its current uh, budgeting was not the, the best solution and that uh, being the body that budgets these kind of things, I don't see a large priority um, changing anytime soon with other you know, balance against other needs that are within the county. Um, I think that there were some valid points of, you know, if if we all agree that it would be better uh, housed elsewhere, you know, why are we picking this entity over others, individuals that have uh, been involved in the industry for a long time? Um, but uh, I would say that uh, Red Cliffs Foundation, which is technically separate from the Red Cliffs Lodge, um, has come with with a proposal, and um, in and for my own feelings of wanting to support the film commission, it seems like this is worthy of uh, a try and a trial. And so I'm for moving ahead with a, a contract that outlines um, some of those conditions. I think, you know, one of my takeaways from uh, Max points was one that I hadn't really considered before was that uh, uh, with the artistic freedom and width of projects that are being considered, that it might not be the most appropriate for governments to be involved in that and that um, uh, we see a full spectrum of kind of film projects that maybe not all citizens would want to uh, uh, support and so that's kind of nice to kind of get that out from under us um, and also his big takeaway that that um, was that I got the feeling San Juan County would be more interested in cooperating with this more independent body than with Grand County directly. And so um, I hope that if uh, it wasn't necessarily housed in this building, that there would be a more cooperative uh, uh, arrangement throughout the region. Thanks, Evan. Mary? I was there as well. Uh, Historically, when the Film Commission was created, it was a nonprofit. That's how it started. And I think it was Betty, Betty Stanton that when she stopped, it kind of went womp. And then Ken Davey brought it into the county as a means when it was like in the 90s when things were so poor, you know, that it was an attempt to you know, stimulate the economy. And he was the economic developer at the time. He moved to the city and it became a city county, uh, you know, managed it. Um, there was, was a lot of discuss that they felt like it could be paid for out of the TR team better from the county. And I think that was a lot of the reasons it was moved over and then it became the county again. But traditionally it was, it was founded as a nonprofit. That was its beginning. Uh, at the meeting, my takeaway was that a lot of the people that were there were, were, were very much in favor of moving it to the uh, foundation. Well, did you say the, were or weren't? Were, I'm sorry. Were, okay. A lot of them were. The people who weren't were the people who work in the industry, <laughs> which is concerning. I think they are very concerned that... Uh, they're not going to, they're not going to be relied on. They're not going to get, that they're going to be overlooked, that their, uh, their involvement in the filming commission, film in this uh, area will be diminished. That was what I took away from the two major people there that I spoke to that I have really concerns about it. 
and then the concerns that uh, it will automatically direct all the money towards Redcliffe. But it's not, we've been struggling with this for a long time. It's been a tough situation for us where I, I don't see it within our county budget that we're going to want to put that. I mean, that's a huge, you know, for it to be, to run the way it should run and, and be uh, salaried, that's, is that, uh, is that something the county wants to take on? Is one thing I think we need to ask ourselves. And is it the county's role? Um, Cause it's almost like it became a public en uh, entity by default. It wasn't originally. It was not the intent of the film commission when it was created. I have some, I, I, so I, I'm very torn if it, if it hasn't come through because I heard the real concerns from people and, and real concerns. And I don't want to ignore that, but at the same time, no one else has come up with a solution. You know, that there hasn't been anything presented that is an alternative. So I am willing to move forward. I, want, I would like to move forward in looking at this with it being probationary. And I think it also in the contract, we have to somehow make sure that all the organizations in the town that work on film have a real say that they are very much part of this nonprofit, this organization, you know, that it, that it happens that way. And that the, uh, you know, the contract is written so that it is probationary and that the other people have, uh, am I making myself clear that, they, okay. Right. Sometimes I don't know if I make myself And so, uh, Uh, you know, uh, I think that something needs to happen. This is a solution. I think I'm comfortable with trying it with those boundaries, with some real strong boundaries and some really looking at it as all the, are, are, the mo are the people being spread out? Are these things happening? And, and, and not, I don't think a one year, contract is a good idea because we found that out just with our uh, diversification. I mean, they wanted us to get that going. Boom. And it takes a while to get things happening. So if we had a probationary period, I would like to see it for at least two years because that would uh, give them time to get on their feet, and figure out what's going on and also give us time to see if it's working. So that is my takeaway from the meeting and from talking to people and is that, yeah, I see some concerns, but I, it's not working here. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Bill? Yeah, I, I uh, would also like to um, quote Colin Fryer. He wasn't able to be at the meeting here today. And so I received a phone call from him several hours ago prior to our getting to our workshop. But he wanted to remind the commission that film is the only art that pays its way. It's the only art form that pays its way moving forward. And then he said several things. One, that he was on site with the Costner group, including Mr. Costner, and that every level during the day, he did nothing but witness the professionalism of Biga. He spoke so highly of what she's doing and what she's accomplishing. And he wanted to, gave me permission to quote him that he's in full support of Bega. Now, he also mentioned that he's friends with the owners of Redcliffe that purchased it from him. And he said they're very concerned because they were approached. They didn't bring something forward to the commission. They were approached by members of this commission and the street strategic development director 
And so as they watch these meetings that go on and the negative aspect that is getting painted on the Red Cliff, they're very concerned. They're very concerned because it isn't the Red Cliff Lodge that's doing this. It's the foundation. And, and they have some real concerns with the perception that the public is pointing fingers at them when they were approached to try and help out with the situation here. So those, those, all of those items came from Mr. Pryor earlier today. Thanks. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for letting us know what, uh, but I think when we look at this, at no offense to you, Bega, but this is not a personality or a person that we're doing this for. No. So, you know, you know, if she's professional, great, you know, but I, this, I think we have to take the personality out of why we're doing this. And we have to get over the fact that this is not revolving around one production horizon. Mm -hmm. You know, when I spoke to some of the people that have been in the industry for forever, they're like, you know, commercials are like the bread and butter, yeah, yeah. right? And so we kind of got to get off that. It's, it's, it's driving me a little crazy. Yeah, Kevin. Um, I, I had sort of a technical question. I, I think in, in recent discussions, and I think Bill mentioned this, as, as did Mary, people floated the possibility that this might be some kind of, you know, probationary or interim, or if it's, you know, we have the option of reverting back to how things are now if we think it's not working. I, I'm just wondering, like, how does that work legally? So I don't know if there's a question for Stephen or for or Briar or something, but um, like, you know, like what, what is the film commission as a legal entity? Is it, is it like some trademark on the name that Grand County now owns or, yeah. And so you, I, I'm just curious whether that's workable. Yeah. So it's a combination of a couple of things. It's all the, the blue sky, the goodwill, all of the marking, everything that encapsulates the film commission. Um, it's everything from the logo to the, vendor list to everything it has. It, it would be weirder pulling it back. I, I don't want to try to say that it would be exceptionally clean to pull it back because what, what you'd be doing is you'd be giving this kind of uh, IP intellectual property to them with an employee, right? And then if you say it doesn't work out, bringing that back, somehow you're going to have to, I mean, we're dealing with people, we're dealing with a human being or whatever that is, Somehow you're going to have to say, well, you can no longer use this trademark, the film commission and these things, but it, there's no guarantee that the people that are hired there would come back to us. Does that make sense? So we can't, we can't force. So if we had Homer Simpson that worked at the film commission, Homer Simpson went out to Red Cliffs, we can't say we're taking them back and drag Homer Simpson back to the county. We could take back the intellectual property. So that's that's the harder conversation. What happens if Homer Simpson liked working at Red Cliffs? What happens if they didn't want to come back? Maybe they can't fly the banner of the Moab Monument Valley Film Commission. Do you see what I'm saying? That's kind of that's why it's going to be. Okay, kind so, of so I, I, yeah, so I, I mean, point well taken that you know people will work where they want to sure. work, and we, we we don't control that. But it sounds like you are saying that that whatever intellectual property there is. That is something that we can yes. kind of loan to the foundation and then yep. you know, take it back if we were for, for, for some reason to become dissatisfied. Right. But at a certain point, um, it it is harder to disconnect the individual employees from the IP entity. Does that make sense? So speak, speaking frankly, B has been there for how many years? Sorry, can I? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. So she's been there for eight years. So in a lot of parts, there is the intellectual property that she's that did. So in agency law, when we pay Vega to come in and to work, the county owns the work product that she creates, all the flyers, all the pamphlets, all of that, right? We own that. But what we don't own is her ability to make relationships with other people. That's the hard part. So while we can put on paper, hey, this is only temporary. I mean, the things that we can pull back, we can pull back the IP, we can pull back the money that we uh, guarantee in the contract. That's kind of what we have control over. The, yeah, the name, I would assume. Oh, of course, the name. Right, which is, yeah. Mary? Is Chris on still? Chris Baird? 
because I know there are certain things that we, uh, that the film commission is required by the state uh, uh, to to do. Yes. And that's what we're responsible for. Yes. And we need to make sure in the contract that those uh, obligations that we are that we have to turn over is happening. And, and that's where we, you know, that's quite, should be our major focus is are we getting the, uh, following the ordinances and such and getting this uh, information that needs to be turned over to the state, turned over to the state. And that's what we will be contracting for, if I understand. Right. Yep. We're not going to be contracting for a person. So if, to me, is if it's not working, then then we're going to have to take that back, that those sure. obligations, and 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 hire someone that does that. If it does not happen through this process, right? Yeah, great. That, that yeah, that that's clarifying for me, Mary. Appreciate it, Kevin. Um. Yes. Yeah, so I. I mean, maybe personally, I, I I don't have strong feelings about this. I think you know people on both sides have, have made good points. Um. But for the moment, is assuming that it were to go to um. You know, some kind of arrangement with the Red Cliff Foundation were to happen. Um, I just wanted to propose a few other things to add to the statement of work, which I think will be uncontroversial. One, one is that you know a lot of the complaints we've gotten have been worries about possible favoritism or, or things like that, and I, I have no idea whether that's gone on in the past. But I think we can all agree that it, you know it shouldn't go on in the future. And so we just added to that list that's in the statement of work that it. One of the responsibilities is to sort of, in a fair and equitable manner, um, meet out you know job opportunities and hotel rental opportunities, that kind of thing. You know, it's just just kind of a soft commitment that they're that they're going to try to be even-handed. Um, that that would make you feel better about it. And then, similar one, you know, one sometimes hears complaints about film productions um, on public lands violating the terms of their agreement with the BLM. You know, and um, I think adding something in there that you know we part of the job of the film commission is to make sure that you know film works, um strict strictly adhere to you know the conditions that landowners impose in particular in you know, public landowners. So I, I just wanted to propose that you know if, if we end up going to Rev Plisk Foundation, maybe that those two things should be added to the state of work. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Not, I, I, th I think my mind is I, again, like Kevin. I haven't had a very strong opinion on this either way, but I think I'm. Uh, I think I'm, I'm. I I think it hasn't been working very well in the county. I I'll agree with with Bill on that, and um, and and we did go to Red Cliffs originally, and I, it, you know, if somebody else stepped up and said if there's a competing interest or somebody really wanted this or was pushing for this or or put a proposal on the table, I think it would be very much in our interest to consider that. Um but um but but I'm I, I like the idea of a of a probationary contract, you know, a year and a half, two years, as Mary suggested, with with guardrails. Um and uh I think that's kind of where 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 my mind is right now. <laughs> and what we're I'm sorry go ahead talking too much. What we're talking about tonight isn't the approval of a contract. It's just saying, well, let's let's move forward in getting something more concrete yeah. to look at. Right. Yes. So it would be plugging the scope of work into an agreement and bringing that forward. Back. Yeah. So I think the, the gaps are in the scope of work is this uh, spreading the love around for how Kevin eloquently uh yeah, verbalize that the, <laughs> the public land impacts yeah. um i don't think there's anything in there now that captures the intellectual property factor and yeah. like bringing that name and imagery or specifying that that's you know also what we're contributing besides um funds i think that also in that meeting there came up some issues and i'm i apologize i'm not really familiar with it that there may be a state level database of uh resources for film and that the local database is subpar or non-existent or mesh, meshed in with that i don't know the things but it, it references in here um a database database including local crew resources 
et cetera, and that that is specified that it's um, that they're included. Yeah, and that that it's that the data about data database tomato tomato is uh, uh, a specific one for southeastern Utah. Yeah. Um, and I th and then to those other questions of uh, what should the scope be, I think if we're looking at you know instigating this at the beginning of the month. That would kind of be a year and a half if we followed it through the end of 2024. Right. So I don't know if that's enough of a chunk. It seems like uh, calendar years might be a nice kind of turnover point. So whether we do a year and a half to start or, or two and a half years to start. Um, well, I think I'd be more inclined to a year and a half myself just to I think you can get a decent idea about how things are going in a year and a half. See, and I'm leaning more towards two and a half just because of what I think part of the problem with, you know, what happened with HB 416 is that we weren't given the opportunity to get things going. We, you know, you're not going to, it's not, you know, it's going to be a work in progress for at least a year. Uh, and although, figuring things out. And although then, this is a bit of a transfer. I mean, it's a, the, yeah, the groundwork's been laid. It's not, we're not starting fresh. Yeah, they, you're right. 16. Never mind. You're right. Uh, so initial enough. contract through the end of 24? I, I, I'd, I'd support that. Yeah. Uh, Stephen? So, so some of the things that I know were important to the commission in the past, I want to make sure we encapsulate them. The idea of the data list or the kind of the film breakdown it's to provide all of the local individuals that do the different types of jobs, fair playing field, just like in a bank, they right. can't tell you, Hey, you should pick this guy, you know, avoiding the good old boys club. So we'd want to instill in the contract, a sense of fair playing field across the board. Like we would like you to have lists that include all vendors. And if the vendors reach out to you, you got to add them to the list. Um, also one of the other things, and I don't mean to make more headache, uh, but this is something that theoretically has been listed on the governor's economic opportunity website for an appropriate expenditure for di for diversification funds. I know you guys are going to be talking about that later, but that is something that's also recognized by the governor's office of being something that funds like this could go towards. Just want to put that out there. Um, but all in all, if there are specific things that you want to see and you want to see included, that's what would really help us be able to draft the contract successfully. And I know Mallory wants to add something about film permits. Yeah, um, so a, a while back we met a group of us and we're looking at the film permitting process because Grand County doesn't have one. And I was just thinking while we were talking through this of maybe that would be a simple thing that we could also put in place um, just to give something a little more concrete that we can watch, but also uh, something we talked about when we had those meetings was just keeping people in the know. So I think like the fire department, uh, roads department, and not to make some onerous process, but something really, really simple and maybe even like a $20 fee just so that there's some tracking that keeps everybody in the loop. Um, I think that that's worth considering and something, again, very, very simple, not a special event permit, but you all might want to consider that. And I don't think that would be um, hard at all. And I do think we could have um, like a form through the county where then they, they submit that. And I think we'd have to talk more, but maybe an idea. Yeah, Bill, you had your hand raised. I think the other thing that we want to add to this contract, and Trish, I'm sorry. No, you go. No, I just was raising my hand. Okay. Um, would be that that we want be back here on, and what is that basis giving some sort of a update or a report, or am I out of line here oh, thinking that we again. want some kind of a like a, a regular reporting requirements? Right. Exactly. Right. We we want to know how it's going, where it's going, what's going on, and and whether it's commercials or the Costner thing, we want to hear some of that. Yeah, no, it's good. So what we put in the scope of work or what's in there, I didn't actually do it, um, would be 
going to, I think for right now it says quarterly travel council meetings, um, and then annually to the commission for a report, um, and also the budget ask each year. So there's a, li a little bit in there. I'm not sure if that suffices, but that sounds good. Mike, haven't heard from you yet. Being quiet. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Trish. I didn't have a direct it. path, if able to use TRT funds, or uh, do we have a direct path to fund that outside of the county, or does it have to remain within? Or can you? Can you we can, do we can use the TRT right. money to fund the position if it was moved. Oh, no, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's been well established. Been well established. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, Trish. So, and what you know. I, Again, I'm not in favor of this, so I, I I don't really want to get into the particulars of the contract. And I hope that's something we could we don't have to hash out tonight. No. Okay. So, but you know, if you sent out an email and said, "Hey, give me your particulars," that that'd be great. And I do think it would be important if there were some commissioners that wanted to be flagged on this, because I think it's it's going to be harder to draft. I think it's going to have to be if 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 the vote is going to be a contract. It would be nice to have commissioners that are involved and know a lot about this and Vega and Brian or, or whoever the foundations can utilize to communicate. We're, we're going to need to go and do the back and forth and have the conversations. I don't know if we can get that done in two weeks time. No. Uh, and, and so yeah, I no. think it's probably a longer, longer process. Yeah. But the harder thing is when we're going through these negotiations, it would be really important if early on we identified these are some things that we want to see. And even if you're against it, I mean, not trying to encourage you to be on there, but having somebody that's passionate one way or the other. Yeah, it's it's helpful no, to help. I'm more than happy to be involved in this. And I interrupted you. Um, no, it's okay. So, you know, one kind of final statement that I'll make is, you know, as a government entity, we're here to look out for county businesses, the citizens, our workforce. And, and, you know, that's our job. And we're unbiased. And, and, the word nonprofit doesn't mean I'm biased, and I'll state that very strongly. I've worked for a lot of nonprofits, and I work with a lot of nonprofits, specifically in wildlife, and nonprofits very much have their own agenda. I'll state that. So, my, again, I'll reiterate that my concern is that the wealth will not be spread, and I'm going to make that very clear, and so that's it. And, and I will state that if it does go, we need to look hard at San Juan County and have them owning up their TRT to help with this, especially when they're putting in massive developments at the north end of, you know, their, their county, they're going to be absorbing a lot of TRT and they can help. I don't know if it's, and, uh, and in, in, it's probably not in the scope of work, but at some point, you know, if we're talking about uh mous or contracts the the makeup of the board of uh um the foundation and what that would look like and representation not just from the county but you know some of these other players in town and industry professionals i think that i think that's a really good uh a really good point and that's something that would uh, if that's something they would be willing to give, that that would guarantee an ability to be heard. I just before we sign on the dotted line, like what is this really going to look like, and what is you know, and, it, and it's going to have to come back back to you guys probably at least I don't even know how many times, um, but it's going to have to come back to you guys a couple different times as we go through this process. So don't feel like this is it. Yeah. You guys have decided. But the reason why we wanted this to be an action item was so that staff can kind of get an idea because we've circled this issue a couple of times. So that's. Yeah, that's really Sorry, I, the thing I would say, I guess I'm a little more uh, optimistic with the time and I, I shouldn't be. I know that there are constraints, but like what optimistic. we are <laughs> hoping for is it's hard to have these conversations. Um, with the Red Cross Foundation, with Vigo, with August, when it's kind of an unknown, right? Of like, well, we can do all this work, we can sort all these things out, but we don't know what the commission wants long term. So I think if, you know, but there's the go ahead, that's what you all would like, um, 
that that would be an important next step, even if that doesn't mean a contract at the next meeting is brought before you guys, just some things so that it, it shows, yes, go ahead and sort these things out. We're in like, we want to see this come back and we want to do a pilot or trial. Right. Mary? I'd like to make a motion. I move to approve the proposed scope of work for moving the Moab Monument Valley Film Commission to Red Cliff Lodge Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and direct staff to prepare a contract that will come before the commission at a future meeting to decide if we want to move forward. Thanks, Mary. All right. A motion on the table from Commissioner McGann and a second from Commissioner Winfield. Um, Further discussion? Kevin, go ahead. Uh, I just realized that I might need to make a disclosure that I've worked in the film industry in Grant County. And so I forgot at the beginning of the meeting. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Um So it, in, in the motion, which is just one of the packet, is it everyone's understanding that that includes you know, the items we discussed about in course. spreading, I think, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. spreading the love and, you know, adhering to the terms of permits from public land agencies and preserving, um, you know, that the intellectual property is on, on loan and not given. I think those were three of the things we talked about. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that the, the motions for the, a scope of work that incorporates those yeah. things. Oh, yes, that's because it's going to come back to us for approval. And if it's not in there, we're not going to approve it. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> so I just wanted to be you know, clear what we were attempting okay. yes. Any, Anyone else have anything further to say before we vote on this bill? Well, I'd like to be clear, too, that if if there is disagreements moving forward with the contract part of this, we still have the option of saying no, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, this is just we're just we're dedicating this. staff hours we're to moving forward. Yeah, because right. otherwise they don't want to move forward if we're not going to even consider it. Right. All right. Um, I, I'm sorry. I guess I want to say one other thing. I mean, I I do think to some of the Trish's some of the point Trish, Trish makes are well taken. I mean, I I think this is, is something that very much includes the public. You know, we wouldn't want to privatize. There's lots of things the county does that you know, is naturally the, the function of government and elected representatives and not shouldn't just be farmed out. Um, I, I guess I I lean toward approving this just because I think there maybe are enough safeguards um, to, to to make sure things don't go wrong in, ter in terms of, you know, maybe we retain the intellectual property or, you know, that, that kind of thing. So um, I, I, th I think those are very valid concerns and it, it does give me pause, but I, th I think I'm willing to Go forward with this, and, and and there are things the county does that that are handled by nonprofits in terms of you know child safety. You know, it's it's easy to think of quasi governmental entities that are doing things, and so sometimes that arrangement does work out well. Yeah, yeah. And on that note, we're talking about funding this with TRT monies, so monies that have been generated by hotel stays and restaurants and that sort. And so this isn't being funded by property tax or or anything like that. This is hopefully a cyclical thing, whereas the film industry goes up, so does the, the hotel stays and, and all the other, not just the direct uh, film-related jobs, but other um, economies in, in town. All right, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hands. And all opposed. All right, motion passes six to one with Commissioner Hedin in opposition. And uh, it's after six, so we have a uh, six o'clock citizens to be heard session. Is there anyone here in the chambers who would care to come forward and make a comment? Yes. <laughs> yeah, please, please, please start by introducing yourself. That'd be I'm great. Green. I went to the meeting and I liked a lot of what I heard. Um, I commented that it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing that really the county should be involved, but the county doesn't always do what's best for the county. And that I didn't like the word um, stakeholders in the meeting because that singles it out when it really is a whole county is involved, employees, jobs. 
I mean, there's a lot of people last year who worked for Horizon, which I know Horizon's not going to be here forever, but that had, um, were able, my grandkids made money to go towards their, their college. And um, a lot of the teachers were able to make some good money. So it's good money. And if we can be positive and, and keep, keep the avenues open to where we can bring in movies or commercials or whatever, then it helps with our diversifying our economy, which is what we're supposed to be trying to do. Um, another thing too is when you said we have to have a form that scares me because then it has to go through permit and then, then everything in this county, they tried to shut down because there's too much going on. So I hate that idea of even having permit process. So I wanna go on the record of being completely against that other than keeping a record of what's going on and knowing how, many, how much money is being made so you can know what's coming through. Um, and also I'm um, really concerned about the fact that there were four commissioners at that meeting and that is a quorum. So that shouldn't happen because I've been on several committees where you can't do that. So I think that that should be um, handled and make sure that doesn't happen again. So thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Anyone else in the chambers care to come forward and, and make a public comment? Yes. Oh. Well, those things that I just want to follow up. I, I wanted to thank all the people that came to the meeting um, two weeks ago. You know, I think we tried really intentionally to do a well facilitated public process to inform this discussion as has been mentioned several times been going in circles in many ways um and so you know i wanted to thank those who are in the room for getting the band who are here and participated um brian and you guys for taking time um, to present and you know i think that the intention for me was that's an opportunity for uh, transparent public dialogue and really getting and chewing into it outside of you know, this venue, even though this is the decision making chamber. And I think for me, just wanted to underscore that, um, you know, I didn't hear a lot of airtime for the actual survey results and you know, the outcomes of the public participation. And I know that you all read them and that is informing the dialogue, but I think I just wanted to underscore that from the public's perception of how the county is trying to actively engage in creative ways to make smart decisions about our collective resources. Um, I was impressed by how that process went, went and I thought that the outcomes um, in terms of the survey results, you know, really leaned um, a certain direction. And I just wanted to honor all of the time and effort the public put in, um, you know, and that that is being uh, taken into account in today's conversation. Great. That's, that's all I was going to say. Appreciate it, August. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, August. Any other, uh, any, anyone else care to come forward to make public comment? Anyone on Zoom, uh, raise your hand or on mic if you'd like to be heard at this time. Any, uh, all right. One more chance. Zoom, anyone care to uh, make a public comment? You can unmic and Looks like not, so we will continue with our agenda. Mary? I just want to address the uh, quorum issue. When we were going through our strategic plan and we were having all those public meetings, uh, one was in front of Star Hall, one was at the Grand Center, one was in different places, I became concerned just because of what Cricket brought up. I thought, well, it's important that we go as elected officials to these gatherings where we're going to hear directly what the public has to say when we're thinking about making. And uh, I, so I called the grand bidder and said, what, how, what does this mean? And he said, did you, did the commission, did the chair of the commission call the meeting? No. Are you just making any decisions at that meeting? No, we're going for information and education. He says, if you're going for information and education and you're not making decisions and you're not, uh, and, it, and it wasn't called by your chair, it wasn't a commission meeting, that it's important for you 
as a commissioner to keep yourself educated and to listen to the public. And the grand bidders is the guru of open public meeting. And I do think there is, we do need to watch our, the perception. It is important. I'll, I'll allow thought. Bill to make a comment, then we'll move on. Um, I, th I think if anything, we need to either have Stephen educate us on this with an actual lawyer's opinion. Um, I don't know who the, this person is you talk to, but this body relies on him for the legal advice. And I'd like to hear his input at some point. It doesn't have to be right now, but um, that's what governs this body. And I think we should hear from him at some point on that matter. I just encourage, I appreciate all the com comments on everything. We can sit down and have a conversation about uh, that at a future date. I think that'd be most appropriate. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Yep. All right. We'll move on to agenda item four, fiscal year 24 invasive species mitigation uh, grant award contract, Utah Department of Agriculture and Foods, uh, Grand County Noxious Weeds Department. And we have uh, Izzy Weimholt, our weed control supervisor, to present. Is Izzy online? Yeah. All right, Izzy. In our... Oh, my tissues. Uh -oh. Um, anyway, is this something easy to present, Quinn? Maybe uh, I could just read it. Probably is. I, yeah, yeah. Would you like me too. Yeah, if you have it in front of you, Evan, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. So this is uh, regarding the fiscal year twenty three Utah Weed Supervisors Association grant award contract with UWSA. Oh, Utah Weed Supervisors Association, Grand County Noxious Weeds Department. This has a fiscal impact of nine thousand five hundred dollars, and it is approved and within budget. So the Utah Weed Supervisor Associate fund projects related to noxious weed control on state lands and has awarded the Grand County Noxious Weed Department $9,500 to treat hoary crests, napweed, hensbane, and hound's tongue in the book cliffs and in the LaSalle Mountains. And we need a couple signatures on that. I think, that, Evan, I I think, think you, you were on item number five there, which is the uh, next one. <laughs> Oh, so, so, so can we just reorder the agenda? I, yeah, yeah, what yeah. Kevin said. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll reorder the agenda. I think that's a great move. Um, so we are okay. addressing agenda item number five, this year 23 Utah Weed Supervisor Association grant award contract. So, so I, I move to approve the fiscal year 23 UWSA grant contract as outlined by Evan. Thank you. Second. All right. Uh, I have a motion on the table by Commissioner Walker, second by uh, Commissioner McCurdy. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. The motion passes unanimously, six to nothing, with uh, Commissioner Hedin absent. Um, all right, we'll move on to number four. And is Izzy, if she sorted out her mic problems, Izzy, are you there? Uh, press star six to unmute if you can hear me. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All right. And we're on agenda number four. Okay. Thank you. Agenda five. <laughs> okay. Is it all right if I share my screen? Yeah. Oops. Bill's going down. Okay. So this is from the last one. I apologize. Okay, so this is for the Utah Weed Supervisors Association grant, correct? Uh, no, this is for the ISM. Uh, oh. We, we did the agenda out of order. So you're right. Okay. You're, you're off the hook for the, uh, yeah. Okay, so for the Invasive Species Integration Grant. That's what yes. Okay, I apologize. Um, so just a little bit of background on this grant. Um, we have applied for this grant um, for several years now. It is one of our biggest grants that funds the Noxious Weeds Department. Um, it funds seasonal labor as well as um, large projects. And I can list them off. Um, we 
have four distinct projects. We have the African Rue Mitigation Project. Um, we have the Moab In Town Giant Reed Ravenna Grass Project. And this year we've added on Myrtle Spurge to that project. And then also uh, the Book Cliffs, which is another project that we've done several years in a row. And then this year we've added Puncture Vine Go Heads to be funded by the ordered I think we're losing you. Can you hear me? We, we lost you for a second, Izzy. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, yes, so the grant cycle is from the 1st of next month until June 30th of 2024. All right, great. And so Thank you. Any any questions for Izzy? Can we see the rest of the weeds? Yeah, do you want to see the pictures? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, so these are um, just Will some visuals. Will you see the calendars plans. every year? So at least one of PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some of these are in the calendar for this for this year. Um, so just some visuals for the plants that I was talking about. This is African Rue. It is the only known patch in Utah so far. We have it here in Grand County, so it's a pretty big priority. Um, Giant Reed, um, this is a project in town um, where we this grant funds uh, the removal process and it also re funds the uh, replacement vouchers for replacement plants. Um, and this project also funds that for Ravenna grass. Um, on the two sides of this picture, we have Ravenna grass on private and public property. And in the middle picture, we have um, Ravenna grass in Mill Creek. I added that just to show that that's why we're concerned about Ravenna grass is because we are finding it all over Mill Creek, um, Grand Staff Canyon, Hunter Canyon, um, yeah. Myrtle Spurge, as seen in the uh, Noxious Weed Calendar for 2023. Um, this is a new project that we've added. Um, it can be a very dangerous plant um, based on the toxic properties of its kind of like sticky sap in it. Um, so we're trying to add um, education and outreach for this plant um, for this grant cycle. So it has some puncture vine. Um, one of the great unifiers of Moab. Um, this year we have um, funding for the removal and um, volunteer coordination for uh, removing this plant. They're amazing. I'm very excited for this year. Vicious. Oh, what was that? No, I said goat heads are vicious. <laughs> oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, they're very, very impressive and uh, painful plants. Um, and then our final project for this grant is takes place in the book cliffs um, in several different canyons. And our target plants are Hound's Tongue, which are the two photos on the uh, left, and then Black Henbane, which is the plant on the right. Um, yeah, and so those are my visuals. And then, did, I'm sorry, I missed the other part. Did we talked about this grant already? Uh, yeah, we, we, we did. We, we passed that already. That one's, we're all good on that. Cool. Then, um, yeah, any more questions on like the background of this grant? So we're approving the Look, grant, correct? Yeah. 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 Looks like, looks like I not. I would entertain a motion though. Um, I move to approve the fiscal year 24 UDAF ISM grant contract. Is that the, did I get the right one? Yes. Yep. Thanks, Kevin. Do I have a second? second. All right. Uh, I have a motion on the table by Commissioner Walker and a second by Commissioner McGann. Uh, any further discussion? Call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Great. Thank you. Bye. Um, agenda item number six, ordinance approving revisions to the airport rules and regulations. And it looks like this one will need to be postponed as per our administrator and attorney. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to review this document. I was hopeful that I would be able to get to it. Um, last meeting, I, I told Tara that I would. I did not. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Mary? I move to postpone item six, the ordinance approving revisions to the airport rules and regulations uh, until uh, ready. Thank you. All right. I have a motion by Commissioner McGann and a second by Commissioner Winfield. Um, all those in favor, raise your hand. And the motion passes unanimously. 
All right, we're on to agenda item number seven, town boat ramp renovation contract with Jones and DeMille for design and engineering work. Elisa Martin, planning and zoning. Hi there again. Um, so yeah, this is coming back around. We actually had had the, um, the 16,000 for the county's contribution on the pre-authorized list, but actually it needed to be the full 64,000 for the entire amount. So that was my mistake. And I'm just first time around doing all the budgeting things. So I'll, I'll make sure not to do that again. But so we had to bring this forward um, in front of you in order to look at the full amount, um, which is uh, the um, 16,000 from the county, and then the 48,000. Uh, that's the grant from DNR, uh, Department of Natural Resources, and through the Fish and Wildlife Service um, Boater Access Grant. And then there's an optional 6,000 that would possibly go towards the topographic survey. And so that is something I'm also asking for approval in case we do need to go forth with that. And I'm, I'm not sure because I've I'm kind of relying on the, the larger group that um, has been putting this all this work together to kind of advise along the way. So I don't know for sure if we're gonna need that, but I, I thought we would put it in there and I do have enough in my engineering budget from planning and zoning to cover that. Um, I do want to just share with you guys really quick my screen. Um, let's see, just to give a quick, to let you know that um, this, are you all seeing this, the Moab Town Action yes. Plan? Okay, so this was the action plan that was put together back when John was um, kind of spearheading all of this uh, from planning and zoning. And so these are kind of our, um, the people that we still have in, in the advising group. So I've reached out to all these folks, most of them anyway, um, and we, we do have a really solid, a group of folks advising on this project along the way. Um, we're also keeping in the loop and, and going to be um, making sure that the stakeholders are continuing to be able to provide input um, through this design and engineering stage. So these are the stakeholders here. So just to let you know that that's kind of how we're going about this. I'm, I'm kind of facilitating through planning and zoning department, but this is really a group effort um, to get this town boat ramp uh, renovation through the first phase of, of the project, which is just basically getting the engineering and design um, all worked out. So hopefully we'll have a nice new boat ramp very soon. Any questions? Uh, I think Bill had a question. Oh, I was gonna make a motion. Oh, great. All right, Bill. I move to approve the contract with Jones and DeMille Engineering for 64,000 for the town boat ramp design and engineering work and up to 6,000 for the optional topographic survey. I'll second that. Thank you. The motion from Commissioner Winfield and a second by Commissioner Hadid. Uh, any further discussion or questions? Looks good. Looking forward to, to getting the boat ramp all spruced up. <laughs> and the whole, the whole thing's underwater right now. I know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I'll call for a vote on the motion. All those in favor, raise your hand. And the motion passes unanimously. Um, on to agenda item number eight, letter requesting participation in county in a water planning panel. And uh, Trish, Commissioner Hedin is presenting this one. Thank you. So I've been working really closely with Ronnie DeRossery from the city council. Regarding water, um, we, as you have noted, you've heard the whole RUP a few times, and um, that organization is looking at water management and planning, as Kevin mentioned, for the next 100 years. Um, as a component of that process, we are looking towards inviting professionals, um, scientists, for basically a public forum. We would love it if public officials would come. We think the more educated that we can provide both our legislators, but also our community, it just helps in water planning far out into the future. So our goal is to invite a hydrogeologist, um, 
a individual and he's from U Utah State University, another individual from Utah State University who is a professor in river studies, specifically on the Colorado River, and then a soil ecologist that specifically deals in desert ecosystems. Again, I think the more that we can educate our public, the better we will be prepared for water planning into the future. So this is just a letter that would ask those individuals if they want to partake in a in a forum. All right. Thanks, Trish. Yeah, um, have you reached out to these uh, the we scientists have not yet? Okay. Yet. So, so in, in... we just felt like it would have more weight if, if the county yeah, absolutely inviting yeah. them. Yeah. Yep. All right. So. Um, I move to approve the letter of invitation to join a panel for water planning. Thank you. Oh, awesome. I got Bill. <laughs> I have a motion on the table by Commissioner Walker and a second by Commissioner Winfield. A little slow to the draw, Evan. Um, uh, discussion. And I, and thanks for and for yourself and, and Ronnie. I, I, I agree. More education is good and hearing from, from folks that really know and yeah, yes. and I will say, I, I think, you know, we've had occasional presentations here and I yeah. often get a lot of positive feedback Definitely. from members of the public yeah. that, you know, it's a complicated issue and yeah. it's good, Very complicated. you know, it's an yes. ongoing process to keep people up to speed on this. So. Yeah. I, and maybe it's not part of this round, but um, I would be interested in the future of hearing from uh, policymakers and planners and people, you know, like, once we've all kind of identified and agreed that it's an issue, like what's the next step? Right. And like, um, right. so I would look forward to that in the future. Great. All right, anyone else? Call for a vote on the motion. All those in favor, raise your hand. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you for supporting that. Thanks. Uh, agenda item nine, economic development advisory board recommendation funds allocation. And uh, this is, back to August and Chris, and this is the action item that was informed by our workshop earlier. And, um, right. Can y'all see my screen again? Yes, I can see your screen, August. Great. Yeah, well, I thought y'all were gonna take as long on those six agenda items as uh, my, my third one. So I ran home, but here we are. Um, <laughs> We've got on here that what was discussed in the workshop specifically following up on um, the Economic Development Advisory Board's um, recommendations, which were $100,000 on top of $300,000 towards the senior business consultant salary and benefits at USU Moab Small Business Development Center, fully funding one year at the Career and Technical Education Student Career and Success Center run by the school district out of the Community Resource Center. Um, on the Free Health Clinic campus for $221,500. Um, and then uh, there was the addition of the charter service to Salt Lake City as uh, proposed by Redtail Air for $95,000. Um, and she consensus to spend the balance on um, towards some kind of a small business loan fund of which the Southeast Utah Association of Local Government Rotating Loan Fund, the Utah Micro Loan Fund and administrative support to open up the Wildcat Microloan Fund were all um, considered, and and I floated the possibility of of me basically going in and doing the research and and making our best guess of what we should bring, you know, in contract phase um, back to the commission on the twentieth. Um, that sounds like uh, my understanding of where we're at. I think the only thing I would ask for further clarification is, you know, what are the specific questions that you want outlined. Um, with the small business loan funds, you know, I heard overhead costs, um, administrative support, interest rates, um, and, you know, perhaps putting in a tentative uh, funding contribution, but everything else, um, is there anything else that folks are particularly keen on me investigating um, in, the, in the intervening weeks? I, th I think ease of execution, just, just, it's not a ton of money. So just making it easier on, on everyone to, to get the funds where they need to go without too much trouble, I guess. I like the idea of being able to add to it if we have the option in the future. Yeah, right. Thank you. 
Can I make a motion? Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'll move to approve the allocation of funds from the Economic Development Advisory Board recommendations as presented by August. Is that okay that I say that, or do you want me to delineate them? The only thing, I'm I'm happy to delineate them. Well, no, the only thing that we want to make sure the number, the total number of them, the total amount of money that we're giving out is an exact and can fluctuate. So higher. Now, if you guys want to continue to fund above what is listed there for a particular one, like the Wildcat, let's say the Wildcat is the spillover and you just want to continue to fill that, the number that we have there isn't exact. That's the only thing yeah. that I would know. So right. listing it out at that exact amount we, there wouldn't probably be the correct. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. Because we don't actually know the exact amount. Right. And, and I don't know. Right. In a, I don't know in a perfect world the calculate to be able to to give it to you to say the exact calculation of how that number is derived. Right. So was everybody in agreement that the if it's sent above and beyond the yep. limit to the revolving yep. fund? Yeah. yeah, I think there there's yeah. consensus, yeah. consensus there. So any additional funds that are permitted by statute to be able to be input into this diversification fund would go into that. Essentially, yep. it would be okay. something people would have. Yeah. So do you want me to restate it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, this is just giving staff direction to right, present right. us with something more yeah. formal the next meeting. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Oh, great. Okay. No good. Am I done? Good. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> All right. All right. I have a motion on the table by Commissioner Dean and a second by Commissioner McCurdy. Um, uh, any further discussion on this? Uh, to August's point, I would be curious about how those different uh funds um in terms of use or what the what cut types of projects they award um there might be subtle differences between them i'm not familiar with them but yeah very very great all right call for a vote all those in favor of the motion raise your hand and that passes unanimously thank you august thank you august for all that yeah. work yeah y'all yeah. have a good rest of your meeting all right, uh, we're on to our consent agenda. Um, our consent agenda consists of item A, local consent, special event, alcohol permit for the Moab Musical Festival, uh, new music at Red Earth, Grotto Concerts 1, 2, and 3, house concert and ranch concert. Uh, consent agenda item B, Grand County Annual Court Security Contract. Agenda item C, BLM Noxious Weeds Contract for a one-year extension. Uh, and D, Grand County Search and Rescue Mental Health Grant. Move to approve the consent agenda as read. Thank you. Sure. All right, I have a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda from Commissioner um, again, and a second from Commissioner Winfield. Any discussion? All in favor of approving the consent agenda, raise your hand. And that passes unanimously. All right, we have a public hearing tonight. Uh, public hearing to consider the ordinance approving the amended and restated development agreement and master plan for Peak View, an HDHO development located on parcel number 02-0027-0024. We have Jenna Gorney from Planning and Zoning. Share my screen with you because you can see the uh, amended master plan and phasing. So as stated, this is an item considering the approval of the PVU amended master plan and development agreement. Um, just for some background for you, on November 6, 2019, County Commission approved the Peak View HDHO District and Preliminary Plat via Ordinance 612. Subsequently, County Commission approved Phase 1 Final Plat in August of 2020, which consisted of 16 total residential units, 13 of which are district for actively employed households per land use code 4.7. The remaining phases two through five have yet to been processed for final plat. The peak view amended development agreement describes a phasing plan for the final plat extensions for each phase as measured from the effective date of an approved amended development agreement and master plan. The proposed extensions are described as follows. A six month extension for phase two final plat approval, which would be a deadline of December 20th, 2023. 
a 15 month extension for phase three, which would fall on September 20th, 2024, a 21 month extension for phase four, falling on March 20th, 2025, and a 27 month extension for phase five, falling on September 20th of 2025. So this essentially is a six month um, extension between, or excuse me, this is six months between each phase, except for between phases two and three. The applicant is requesting that nine month extension between these phases because it includes twice as many lots as is included in phase three or four, and thus more infrastructure would be required to be built. The applicant is also amending their master plan to eliminate the proposal of twin homes and replacing them with single family dwellings, which would reduce the unit count from 127 to 96. The development agreement is amended to clarify Article 4.7 of the Land Use Code to allow businesses, excuse me, local businesses or nonprofits to hold title to HDHO units if they qualify as actively employed households uh, per 4.7.3A2 of the Land Use Code. The reasons the applicant has given for the delay in the final plat approval for the remaining phases include delays caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and associated increase in costs for construction, county staffing transitions and shortages since the county approved the HHO development, and deficiencies within the land use code being silent as to how the lapse of approval is otherwise affected by a phasing plan. In addition, the applicant had filed an administrative appeal with the county and then a complaint with the Moab District Court challenging the application of certain provisions of the HDHO rules and regulations as related to the project. Uh, Such litigation has also delayed, of course, the applicant in pursuing the further phases of the development as the litigation is pending the outcome of this request. The proposed amended development agreement and master plan is in conformance with the land use code section 4.7 in that uh, the plan does provide for the minimum 80% deed restricted lots for primary residential housing. Um, excuse me, primary residential housing for actively employed housing. The amended development agreement also includes a provisions of land use code 4.7.3, which defines actively employed households to include an owner or owner's representative of a business or entity with a primary place of business within Grand County. Additionally, the proposed amended master plan includes a phasing plan, which does conform to Grand County land use code HDHO requirements in that in regards to the 80% set aside for HDHO deed restricted lots per phase. So phase two and phase three set aside 81% total lots in each respective phase and phase four is also 81%. Um, phase five is proposing 78% deed restricted so at the completion, the development provides 78 deed restricted lots out of, 90, out of 96, which does meet that 80% requirement. Um, additionally, at a public hearing on May 22nd, the Planning Commission voted four to zero with three absences to send a favorable recommendation to the County Commission for approval of this. We do have, it looks like I think Jennifer Johnson is online if she would like to answer any questions back there as well for you. All right. Um, yeah, it's public hearing, so I open the public hearing before we do anything, correct? I've done this a million times and it still confuses me. Stephen's nodding, so. Okay, uh, thanks, Jenna. And I will now open uh, this public hearing to consider the ordinance approving the amended and restated development agreement and master plan for peak view and HDHO development located on parcel number 02-0027-0024. Four. And I um, uh, now we can take comment. Uh, before that, I, I guess we'll have uh, any. Does anyone have any questions for the developer or for Jenna? Yeah, I have two questions for the developer. Um, one, and and I realized that you stated or Jenna read the reasons for the extensions, but I guess I want a little bit more detail. Um, it's yeah, the delays in this are, are a concern, and I've actually had some citizens concerned about this also, and have asked me about that. So why the extensions? And then the other question is, um, why going from the townhomes, or, or the two, is that correct, Jenna, how you said, stated that, that they were townhomes, to just single family? Because in the end, it's a reduction in our HDO, HO capacity.
Hi, my name is Wesley Felice. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm a, a counsel for the Johnstons. I'll be here tonight representing them. Uh, they are on as well, so they can answer additional questions. Uh, but I just wanted to start uh, by just introducing myself and letting you know who I am and uh, letting you know that I'm here to to answer your to try to answer your questions tonight. Um, as far as sorry, were you raising your hand? No. Oh, my my apologies. I thought you were asking another question. <laughs> um, so maybe Jennifer would be a better. Uh, some probably have a better answer for you on your first question. Um, and so I might ask her to speak on that. But as to your second question, what I'm understanding it is, is you're asking why we no longer are including the twin homes with the subdivision. Right. Is that correct? Right. So the problem with the twin homes, and I'll try to put this in the best terms possible, was that the twin homes were really created uh, as a way for the developer to make additional money on this on this uh, this sub this project, uh, the planning and zoning department uh, recommended at the time that my clients include these homes, um, not necessarily to increase density per se, for the purpose of increasing density, but for the strict purpose of um, of asking or sorry for the strict purpose of uh, increasing profit for the developers to make this deal pencil. Once we went ahead or the county went ahead and passed the HDHO rules and regulations that were the subject of the lawsuit that you guys are aware of, um, that limited the pool of investors who actually wanted to purchase these homes. As Jennifer and Terrell tried to list these properties to sell on the market to citizens who would qualify for HDHO qualification under the rules and regulations, they found there was not a market for these homes to anyone else but investors. So while somebody may want to rent a twin home, not very many people want to own a twin home. And so the reason for our the reason for this uh, for this elimination of the twin homes within this amended master plan is simply because there is not a market for these properties. The eight that are currently on the property so four buildings, eight units have not been sold and the developer has held on to them because they just can't sell them. And so it makes no sense for, our, for the developer to moving forward uh, to keep those twin homes on the rest of the lots if they are not a marketable product. Is, is the, I have not checked it in on this myself. So I'm going to state that I have just heard through the grapevine that when you attempt to go through the website and to show interest that it actually doesn't go anywhere. And I don't know if maybe you guys don't know yeah. that. But I've heard that it kind of leads to a dead end. So that's a problem if you're trying to find perspective. Um, I, I know that Jennifer stopped taking uh, responses on these because we were unsure if phase two was going to move forward. So, okay, so that, that's, that's the okay. reason if there's an issue with the website now, that's the potential reason. I see that Jennifer has her hand raised, so I'm going yeah, to turn my time say, over to her. Go ahead and, and uh, unmute yourself, Jennifer. Hi, sorry, no. Um, I was actually just going to answer, just respond the way that Wes did. Um, actually, my website is still working. I, I got a subscriber today. So the, everything is still functioning as far as I know, but Wes is correct. We halted taking reservations because after phase one, we didn't know the fate of the rest of the entire project. And so I didn't want to make false promises to people and get a bunch of people excited for something that may very well never happen. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Anyone else have a question? This, I have a question, and I don't know if it's for Jenna or uh, Stephen, but with the loss of total units and the delay on the project, uh, do we have the ability to approve this with a condition of changes in the percentage for deed restricted or the number of units that are deed restricted? 
Uh, so, so you say that again? Uh, because it was approved uh, four years ago, and, and we still are waiting on them. Um, could we change the, the split between non-restricted and deed-restricted units? I, I can speak to that. I, I think the, and unless, and I'll definitely oh, defer right. to Stephen, but the, this is Elisa from Planning and Zoning. Um, the development agreement is being amended as part of this. And so the original rezone approval, the, which was the development agreement and the master plan are being amended. So therefore the it replaces what was originally approved and and that's how I think it would it would work. Um, so they're basically, yeah, taking the original approval and, and amending that. And so with these new uh, numbers, but they're still meeting the eighty percent for each but phase. Could we could we ask for ninety percent? Oh, I don't know if we could do that based on our land use code. I, I that would be kind of a that would definitely be more of a a Stephen question, probably in terms of um, adding things to the development agreement beyond what we have in the land use code. I, it's, uh, Kevin, go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I maybe I'm missing it, but I, I'm not sure what the concern is on the part of other commissioners that they're not building quite as many units as originally planned. I mean, you know, this is one of the developments that actually has built units, and they've got a timetable for building even more. And I, I don't see what, you know, we're just sticking with the 80%. I, so that, that seems reasonable to me and it, and it doesn't seem reasonable to ask for a change in that percentage. Um, no, I would have to look at the contract, but it would be, it would be a big ask to, to require them to come up with that amount of money or with that amount, um, especially if they've anticipated doing something else. And I think also, this is, you know, the structure of the HDA short, you know, when we were drafting the HDA short ordinance, that's, that's the theme of this meeting is history of HDHO. Um, we explicitly anticipated that someone might build phase one and never get to phase two or something like that. And that's why we have this provision that each phase, at the end of each phase, you have to have at least 80%. And, and that's what they're outlining here. Right. So this, this idea that someone might not build all their phases or the project might be a little bit smaller than was originally planned. I mean, that's that's something we anticipated all along and I, I don't think it's a big problem personally. So. Yeah, uh, both Jennifer and Wes, uh, Wesley have their hands up. Would one of you uh, like to go? Wesley, I'll, I'll go with. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to speak to this. So one, one of the concerns I have with trying to say and trying to ask for a 90% here is first of all, the code does make a very specific uh, regulation regarding 80%, not 90, not more than that, but 80%. From a practical viewpoint, the developer has to make money on this deal in order for it to work. And when you start raising it above 80%, that deal starts to not pencil. And if the deal's not going to pencil, then there's no reason for the developer to move forward with building the units, which is why, you know, from our perspective, asking for more than the 80% is unreasonable. Jennifer, do you have anything else to add? Um, yeah, this is Terrell Johnston, uh, Jennifer's husband. We just kind of along with what Wes stated, we, uh, we think that's very unreasonable. Um, you know, a lot of the HDHO developments are three, four, or five units. We're providing a lot of units. We're trying to anyway. And um, I also just want to remind the commission, um, it's kind of being insinuated every time it's talked about that, like, we're delaying this and that. Like, we, we were promised very clearly one thing. We were, we, we were told another, which, instant, which instigated a lawsuit. Um, we would love to be on, like, phase four right now. Believe me, this has done nothing but cost us money and time and energy, and it's it's not on like it's not because we want to. I'll just say that. So we would we would have loved to kept going. It's not it's not as if we're just stalling on purpose. Um, but anyway, yeah, we think that that's very unreasonable, and we would definitely not move forward with ninety percent. It's hard enough to do it with eighty. But uh, thank you for your time. Great, thank you. All right. I would yeah, also just like to make sorry. I'd also also just make like to make a point that there's probably also an equal protection issue 
with requiring my clients to 80 to, to, to produce more than 80%, but not requiring other developers in the county to also produce more than 80%. So, I mean, from a constitutional perspective, it's just wrong. Um, right. Okay. Got it. No, I just, I think the overall thought is, you know, we have been hearing repeatedly that this program isn't working. And the reality is we don't really know that, right? Because of delays such as this. So the goal is we just want you to move forward. Um, we understand, I mean, I understand I've built a lot of homes. I, I do understand that construction is hard. And right now specifically construction is very hard. Um, but we we would like you to just start plugging along it, and um, so yeah, that's that's the main goal. I I have heard concerns from citizens specifically about this HDHO development, and I was just conveying that I wasn't making an accusation myself, just stating like I am a representative of my community, and so stating what constituents are talking to me about. Thanks. All right, I'd, uh, I'd like, this is a public hearing, so I'd like to open it up to public comment. Um, is there anyone here in the chambers who'd like to come forward and comment on this particular uh, public hearing? Is there anyone from the public online who would like to make a comment about this? All right, then uh, I'll leave the public hearing open until 5 p.m. on Wednesday the 13th, and we should be seeing this again at our next uh, commission meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, uh, we've come to the end of our um, uh, agenda. I would entertain a motion to go into closed session if someone would like to make that motion. I'll make a motion to go into closed session. And I think you need to state the. Uh, oh, state the a reasonable imminent litigation, purchase, exchange, lease, or sale of real property, and character, professional competence, or physical, mental health of an individual. Going oh. for a triple header. Triple header. It looks like it. Oh, <laughs> I, think, I think that's a first. Thanks. So I have a I have a motion. And I will take Evans as a second. All those in favor of going to closed session, raise your hands. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Trish made the motion and Evan made the second. Yes. No problem, Gabe. All right. Uh, so blushing it out a little. Closed session. Let's try this now. I know. That's my little zing you can get too many hands. It's my go-to on long drives. My coffee is like like that. That I don't do. I like the salt and vinegar ones. Like the wasabi or but my kids like so I don't get that because they'll eat.